everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're going to go ahead and begin tonight's meeting of the Capitola City Council. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Um, Council Member Bertrand. Council Member Bator. Here. Council Member Story. Here. Vice Mayor Brooks. Here. Mayor Peterson. Here. And I believe that we're waiting for Council Member Bertrand uh, to join by phone. We're having some technical difficulties, but he should be with us soon. Yes. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. all. Great, thank you. Now we're going to move on to a report on closed session. I believe our city attorney is calling in at the moment, but the, there was two items listed on the closed session agenda, conference with labor negotiations, labor negotiators, excuse me. Um, the city council met with labor negotiators and gave direction, took no reportable action. There are uh, MOUs with <clears throat> most of the groups listed for labor negotiations on the open session agenda. The liability claim of Esther Phillips was discussed in closed session. Uh, it will be agendized for the next council meeting in open session. Thank you. Uh, do we have any additional materials for tonight's meeting? Yes, there were three additional materials sent out prior to the meeting. The uh, staff report and supporting materials for item 7F. There was a public comment in support of item 8B and there was an updated staff report and attachments for item 8G. Great, thank you. Are there any additions or deletions for tonight's agenda? Staff has no changes. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, now's the time for public comment, but before we move on, I think there was some uh, instructions perhaps from uh, staff on how to participate in tonight's meeting that I think would be helpful before we begin uh, public comment. Do we have that information that we could share? We do. Thank you. So, in accordance with the current Santa Cruz County Shelter in Place Order and the Governor's Executive Order N2920, this meeting is not physically open to the public. As you can see, council and staff are meeting over Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. As always, the city council meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and will be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturdays following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Ch Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. If you are watching on Community TV and would instead prefer to join the Zoom webinar, please visit the City of Capitola homepage and click on City Council Meeting under Upcoming Events, as you see circled on the screen. As a webinar attendee, your microphone is muted for the entire meeting unless you request to be unmuted during a public comment period. You do not need a microphone, camera, screen, or computer if you want to listen to the meeting, the meeting is accessible by landline or mobile phone. To join the webinar using a telephone only, dial any of the following numbers on the screen now. The webinar ID is also provided here. As the mayor just mentioned, the mayor will announce the public comment period for each item. There are several ways to make a public comment. If you are a Zoom webinar attendee, simply click raise your hand and wait to be unmuted by our moderator. If you've called into Zoom by phone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand and again, wait to be unmuted. You can also email public comment. Send your email to the address shown on the screen now. 
one comment made verbally or by email per person per item is allowed. If you send more than one email about the same item, the last received will be read and displayed. Comments received outside the public comment period will not be included in the record. Thank you. All right. Uh, now is the time for members of the public to address the council uh, on items not on tonight's agenda. I see we have a hand up already and I'll pass it over to Larry uh, to moderate uh, our public comments uh, tonight and I will uh, leave it up to our staff that are present in chambers tonight to ensure our uh, three minute timer is going. Excellent. Okay, so I have, we have a hand raised, uh, Raymond Cancino. Good evening, Council. How are you? It's Ray Cancino, CEO of Community Bridges. Just wanted to uh, have a public comment uh, on last week's decision on the severe budget cuts to nonprofits. Uh, we're really disheartened that during a time of such uh, incred immense and incredible need in our community, um, the Council moved forward with the budget as uh, suggested. We understand the current Council's uh, approach, but we really wish that the Council took a different approach to try to solve the problem at hand. We hope that um, as my public comments uh, were stated last week, that you'll work with nonprofit organizations to try to figure out other creative ways to raise revenues and to increase the ability to potentially uh, offset some of these potential cuts that will have a detrimental impact on our community. And we hope that you continue to work with us on having creative ways as we reopen and use tourism, which is a number one way um, Capitola raised funds uh, to be able to also help offset and hopefully invest in uh, our community and our community needs. So thank you for your time and thank you for your service. And I know these uh, decisions are, are, are not easy and you do not take them lightly and we appreciate your partnership. Thank you, Raymond. We appreciate your comments. Uh, are there any other public comments tonight? I do not see any hand. Oh, wait, I do see a. Um, but I think that's for the uh, item uh, on the agenda. I can make sure, but I think it's for the, um, Maura, is that for the item 8G or public, just regular public comments? Okay. All right. Well, I have a, I have a couple emails that I will, Try and get read. Okay. Okay. Um, so I gotta sh share screen. Okay. Hello, Capitola City Council. I have learned that the BLM is planning a protest in our village on July 1st. I do not see it on your agenda so I will submit in public comment. As a resident of Capitola, I am concerned about the group being allowed to assemble in the Monterey Park area. This is a neighborhood park where neighbors take their children to run in the grass and play. It is also in a residential area. As a nearby resident, I am not terribly excited about this decision to allow the meetup to be in the park. If this protest must take place, perhaps a better meeting area is in the lower city parking lot rather than our grassy neighborhood park in a residential area. The parking lot is paved and can handle the extra foot traffic that this indeed will bring rather than in a grassy park. I am confident you are planning the correct police presence to protect residents and the businesses in the village where these protesters will walk. I am particularly concerned, however, for the people using the outside dining areas in the streets of the village that has just recently been established. What particular attention will be paid to these visitors' protection? Thank you for your consideration. Cheryl Lynn Ulstad, Capitola resident. I have a couple more. Dear City Council members, Leah Samuels, Executive Director of the Human Care Alliance, here. 
We wish the council took a different approach to solve the budget problem and hope that you will look to other ways to ensure you. Oh. All right, stop. The budget problem and hope that you will look to other ways to ensure you meet the growing needs of your constituents. We are not looking for handouts. We are a critical piece of public safety just like the police department. The ACLU has called for a divestment of police departments because they really aren't best equipped for much of the work they are tasked with. One suggesting made by the ACLU is to develop mobile crisis services, peer crisis services, and crisis hotlines and warm lines where people can call when they just need to talk to someone who understands what it's like to live with mental health problems to support people who have a behavioral or mental health crisis. This is the future of public safety. We are not here to attack you or question the good you have done in your life. We are here to work with you to make appropriate changes as new facts come out which should influence how you fund public safety. We are not here to attack the police. This is not a police v. nonprofits appeal. This is an appeal for you to start questioning if the status quo of how we respond to hard economic times is really in line with best practices for best outcomes. These are not easy changes to make logistically, but it is easy to start working with us to try something new and be an example to other community leaders that you are brave enough to hear about the systemic inequities in our country and take action. Fighting inequity is not a community service, it is our responsibility. It is the right thing to do and in the long run, it actually benefits everyone's public safety and finances. Thank you for your time. Leah Samuels, Executive Director, The Human Care Alliance. My name is Bob and I have lived in Capitola for 40 years. I've used Meals on Wheels for a number of years. I'm sad to hear that the city of Capitola is considering cutting funding for the program. I know it's one meal, but it could be your only one meal of the day. It may seem funny living here in Capitola and needing assistance, but the world is tough out there right now and it's very hard for seniors and disabled. I think it is a big mistake if you are considering cutting the program from audio transcription. This is the last one. My name is Sister Joan Derry and I am living in Capitola and I have been grateful to receive Meals on Wheels for the last five or six years. I'm aware that there is some kind of preparation or consideration that there's going to be a cut to the funding for the Capitola area. I feel very strongly that there are a number of people besides myself who are very needy for meals because of age and health. I hope that won't happen and it would be very detrimental for me and others. Besides helping me in terms of my health, financially I'm on a very strict budget so it has really been a great gift to me and I am very grateful for it. I just am hoping that there'll be no change and that the wonderful people I've met who have come to be of service will be able to continue. From transcription. I, that is the last email. All right. And there's no other hands raised. All right. Thank you all for your comments. We appreciate it. Uh, we're going to move on to city council and staff comments now. Uh, if there's any member of the council that would like to make a comment, please use the uh, raise hand function. Uh, we'll start with Vice Mayor Yvette Brooks has her hand raised. All right. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Um, so I just wanted to ask that staff bring back at our next city council meeting um, some options in bringing back lifeguards. Now that our beaches are going to reopen, I'd like to see what some to revisit that. Um, as mentioned, we would do so when we decide to um, not move on with that contract. Um, and also I want to say that as a leader in our community, I feel it is necessary to remind our community that we must practice anti-racism in order to shift the paradigm of intolerance. Racism is real and it exists everywhere, even in Capitola. Therefore, we must take action to be, bar to be part of the solution. If you are interested in joining the movement on July 1st at 5 p.m., there will be a Black Lives Matters March in Capitola. 
this peaceful protest is sponsored by the same group that put together the Paddle Out and March in Santa Cruz. For those concerned about safety, our police department and staff have been working directly with the group's director. For those of you concerned about your health and safety in relation to COVID, there are many other ways to support the cause if you don't feel comfortable in attending, such as shopping at Black-owned businesses or donating to organizations that support communities less fortunate than ours. And as I've said in a previous council meeting, I will continue to exercise my privilege as an elected official to speak fearlessly and with cause, and I will continue to remind our community of my message at every city council meeting until the protests have ended. When I look back at this time, I wanna be proud of our history and changes that we made during my service. I wanna be part of the solution, and I hope our community does too. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. And let me see, I don't see any other hands up from other council members. So, all right. So um, before we move on, I just want to um, thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks, for your comments. And um, the we received a, a public comment about concerns for safety. I know we received an email about concerns that um, a protest would uh, quote from the email uh, go bad. In our discussions, in my discussions personally with the organizer, I have no reason to believe that that will be the case. In my understanding of the violence that has occurred in protests, that um, that this has largely been determined to be from outside groups who are using the Black Lives Matter movement uh, as a way to sow discord in communities. And it's not the um, protesters within the movement themselves causing this kind of damage and violence. So. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to supporting this movement. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks, for your support of this movement. Uh, and moving forward, I think this is gonna be a good opportunity uh, to support a, a social movement that's, that's very much needed in this time. Uh, with that, I'm seeing no further comment from staff. We're gonna move on, or excuse me, from council. Uh, we'll move on to see if there any staff comment tonight. I think all of our comments are wrapped up in the presentations and the COVID update. So no. All right, great, thank you. Uh, okay, with that, we'll move on to item seven, which is our consent calendar. Uh, all of the items listed on the consent calendar will be enacted in one motion in the form listed on the agenda. Uh, there's no separate discussion on these individual items unless a motion, or excuse me, unless a member of the council or of the public selects to pull an item for separate discussion. I do see that council member Bottorf has his hand up. Are you looking to pull an item from consent, council member Bottorf? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I do have a comment on one item. Uh, let's see, item, uh, item uh, E. Uh, I, I do plan to vote to support it. I just want to make a comment on that item. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and hear your comment. Okay. I, I, I know that at this time uh, we, it's important that the council scrutinizes every dollar that we spend and receive. Uh, I know that the restaurant on the wharf has been impacted during this time, and uh, I, I can appreciate the generosity of staff making the recommendation. They're going to be opening on the 19th, and we're not going to charge them for the rent. Um, I, I just know that in, in, in other events that may happen later on this year, we've shown tremendous generosity to businesses, and uh, we may not be in that position moving forward to, to extend such generosity because we we are making significant cuts and I think it affects everybody in our city. So I'm okay with supporting this measure, but I just, when it comes to property that the city leases, we need to be very concerned about what gifts we give away at this time. Thank you, Mayor, for allowing me to make those comments. Thank you, Councilor Rochler. All right, uh, seeing no further hands up from any council members, uh, we are looking for a motion uh, to pass consent agenda. I move that we pass the consent agenda. I'll second. All right, we have a motion by Council Member Breton to second by Council Member Story. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Bottorf. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. 
We're going to move on to our general government and public hearings, uh, beginning with item 8A, an update on the city's pandemic response. And I will turn it over to staff for a staff report. Mayor and Council, I want to apologize. I was trying to share my screen on the earlier introduction to the meeting, and I realized after I'd done it that I was sharing the screen with only myself. So this time, let's see if I can more successfully share my screen and then pull up the slides. Okay, so I believe this is the seventh or eighth uh, update we've done since the pandemic has begun. Um, one of the things we usually start with is taking a look at the situation here locally. I am sure as folks know that the last week, uh, we certainly had a troublesome day several days ago where we had, I think it was 20 or maybe just over 20 cases recorded in the county, which was by far a new high. Um, here in Capitola, uh, we have had a significant increase in cases. Last week, I think I reported that it was eight cases in Capitola. This week, it's 13. Um, so certainly the trend hasn't been great for us this last week. The overall, the County of Santa Cruz is doing well. This is a chart that shows the number of the percent of number of cases per 100,000, percent of the population that has been uh, infected and compares the various counties in our state. And you can see that Santa Cruz County is still among the, the, the leaders, one of the lower um, lower case incident rates uh, compared to other counties around the state. Uh, statewide, I'm sure you've heard the news that the numbers have not been great. Again, uh, we've been hitting some record highs, I think, in terms of total cases, uh, where I think recently we saw 5,000 cases uh, statewide, a uh, number of days, maybe it was yesterday or the day before. So the overall trend is not looking positive. Um, However, we just need to keep our eye on it and see uh, how things progress as we move forward. Uh, yesterday, the health officer issued an order that lifted the beach restrictions. Um, so at this point now, there are no restrictions on beach use. Uh, in addition, the health officer reissued their face cover, her face covering order to more closely align with the state order so that they're basically the same order so there wasn't any difference between the two. Um, and as everyone knows, on June 18th, the governor issued an order that mandated face coverings be worn throughout California. Um, I want to talk about a couple of different sort of funding pieces, one of which we have not yet talked about as a council, and then a second one we'll touch quickly on the CDBG funding. The CARES Act funding, there is an allocation in the proposed state budget of about $12.28 per capita allocation to local cities. For Capitola, that would mean about $125,000. Um, there was a, a formula for cities with populations over 300,000 where they would receive significantly more, but for cities under $300,000, it's the $12.28 per person. That obviously doesn't go very far in closing a $4.5 million budget deficit. And in addition, the, fund, the, re the revenues are restricted in what they can be used for. It really needs to be used for expenditures that were incurred as a direct response of the COVID-19 health crisis. They can't have been budgeted um, before the crisis began, and they need to have been incurred between March 1st and the end of the year. So right now we've identified about $30,000 of COVID related expenditures that are clearly eligible for reimbursement. However, the final guidance from the state has not yet been issued. And so when that guidance is issued, I think we'll have a clear understanding about whether <clears throat> some of the police over time and the policing costs that we've expended, whether those are eligible or, uh, or not. And so at our meeting in July, we plan to come back to the council with an update about um, whether there is more money in this 125 that we'll get from the state or whether it's been already been expended on, uh, on the existing response that we've had. The CDBG funding, we spent some time talking to the council about that. We were actually hoping to come with an update. Um, you recall that we applied for the CDBG funding. We appointed a subcommittee of council member, or, uh, excuse me, Mayor, uh, Peterson and Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, as a summary, we have $168,000 of CDBG funds that we can use during this first stage. That's comprised of both new grant funding as well as uh, what we call CDBG reuse funds, which are repaid old loans. 
Um, the issue at this point is, is that the CDBG guidance and training, uh, they're still ongoing and there's still open questions about how many different grant recipients we'll be able to um, give money to and exactly how the funding needs to be administered. So the subcommittees met, they've come up with some preliminary recommendations and then we'll be bringing that to the July meeting uh, for the council to get a more full update. And like I said, we were planning on doing it this evening, but the guidance was still in development and we realized there were still too many unanswered questions. So with that, I'd like to ask Chief McManus to give us a short update about the plans on July 4th. Uh, obviously, when we were putting this together, we were thinking that the situation on the beach was gonna be that we were gonna have the daily closures. That's obviously no longer the case. So Chief McManus, can you talk to us briefly about the July 4th plans? Thank you. I can. Good evening, Mayor Peterson, council members. Uh, as we're all aware, the uh, removal of the beach restrictions daily from 11 to 5 um, is effective at midnight tonight, as mentioned. And so that, that changed our July 4th plans operational order um, minimally, but not significantly. Um, the, the one um, significant change is that we will not be utilizing private security to staff uh, many of the entrances to the beach as was part of our early plan because they don't believe there's going to be a need for that without the restrictions on the beach. So when we talk about July 4th, as most of you know, that is by far the busiest holiday we have during the year here in the city. Not the busiest event for the year, but the busiest holiday. And this year, with the 4th fallen on Saturday, the first time in many years that the actual holiday has fallen on a weekend, uh, we expect that it's going to be even busier. And in fact, it's a three-day operational period for us in the police department as opposed to a single day operational period. So we will have all officers working on July 4th on that Saturday, where the city divided into two command locations, the beach command and the patrol command. Uh, we have a large number of officers assigned to the beach command, uh, seven total with two motor officers and two officers on bicycles, primarily work at 11 in the morning until about nine at night. Uh, with the beach closing, as we always do, uh, at 10 o'clock p.m. on July 4th. And we will have an operational command post, as we've done uh, many of the uh, years past up at New Brighton Middle School. Uh, I'll be up there with uh, some of my supervisory staff up there on the school grounds. We're establishing, uh, we did it for the first time last year, a fireworks hotline here at PD. It'll be staffed by a couple of our volunteers. Uh, I'll push that information out via social media at the beginning of the week next week so that we provide our citizens uh, and others in the area the ability to directly contact us if they have concerns or complaints about illegal fireworks. Uh, by the way, as we all know, the only allowable fireworks by law uh, are the safe and sane uh, fireworks, and those are only allowable on private property, uh, as a reminder. Uh, thanks a lot to Public Works uh, working with us on this plan. They will have the portable lighting out there um, uh, to be utilized if needed. Uh, late in the evening, we'll have three uh, lighting stanches on the beach area. Um, we do not have lifeguards on duty uh, for the July 4th weekend. However, we have made contact uh, and are continuing to maintain our contact with Central Fire and their water rescue personnel. They have morning briefings and afternoon briefings. We'll be in touch with them uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday so that we can uh, connect with regard to concerns, update on numbers, and certainly update on uh, staffing needed. Um, as well as, most importantly, the direct contact with those emergency services should we have a need for lifeguards uh, on the beach. Uh, Public Works is working through the weekend, as they always do with, uh, with their staff. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Jess Spring, they'll be uh, working through the weekend with, uh, with us to make sure that uh, they're available to take care of some of the uh, trash needs, uh, the cleaning of the bathrooms, and then other issues that might come up during the weekend that require some Public Works uh, response. And so we're looking forward to a busy, enjoyable weekend, uh, a three-day operational period, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, with our maximum personnel or staffing um, taking place on Saturday, and then plenty of officers available on both Friday and Sunday. And I'll turn it back over to the city manager for questions. Thank you. So I just have one more slide before I wrap up this presentation. Just a summary of the open facilities at this point. City Hall, the Police Department, City Play Parks, although the play structures, I believe, remain closed. The wharf and the beach are now open. The beach parking lots are open. 
the closed facilities are the community center, the museum. Uh, I know that they are working on an opening plan for the museum and then the select parking along the Esplanade that's been closed for the outdoor dining. And with that, um, I'm available for questions. All right. Do any council members have uh, questions? It looks like Council Member Botorf, is your hand up for a question on this item? Uh, sorry, Mayor, I'm not taking my hand back down. Thank you for that. No, no problem. All right. Um, Council Member Story. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, my question is, um, you know, with uh, uh, public health officers uh, open the beach, but at the same time, um, uh, and with the state um, mandating face coverings, um, was my question was, uh, what is our plan to enforce um, face coverings um, and also to assure that the businesses uh, are going to be requiring face coverings um, for the patrons in their um, premises or in line uh, for their business. So I will reply to the first part of the question, which was about the beach. Um, the face covering orders apply to when you are out of your home in public, indoors, and outdoors when social distancing cannot be observed. So being on the beach in and of itself without a face mask on is not a violation. It's being on the beach if it's crowded without a face mask. What we have been doing so far with the face coverings, and I believe that this is consistent with most jurisdictions in the state, is really operating almost like a code enforcement process that we will support businesses if they need help with um, a customer who refuses to wear one going into the store. But we have not had active patrols going out and looking for folks to cite um, outside of the face mask. So we offer we make ourselves uh, available to the, to the individual stores. We have uh, communicated with the stores about making sure that their employees understand what the store's uh, policies are about the face mask and how they expect them to enforce it. Uh, and we certainly are make our officers available should the, should the store need help with enforcement. Chief McManus, do you have anything to add about the face mask, face covering enforcements? I think you, um, just a couple of things, I think you touched on most of it. Uh, we will be visible um, on the beaches in an effort to gain compliance as it relates to both social distancing and facial coverings, both for the public when they can't maintain the social distancing requirements, they should be wearing their masks, as was mentioned, we've talked about that previously as well as uh, a resource for the businesses um, or an ability to or, or efforts to continue to communicate with the business to make sure that they are adhering to the requirements of the new outdoor dining specific to distancing and facial coverings and those who aren't participating in the outdoor dining to the requirements that are laid out in Appendix A uh, and asking them to ensure, and most of them do, they have the proper signage and the proper employees and staff in place to communicate with their patrons to gain compliance, ensure that the patrons are complying with the official uh, uh, social distancing and facial covering laws. Okay. Thank you both for that response. All right. Any other council members have questions? Seeing none, I will turn it over to Larry, our moderator, uh, to help us out with public comment on this item. Mayor Peterson, I see one hand raised. Janelle? Hi. I would just like to know that if we are opening the beaches, why we do not have the require or any lifeguards on the beach. Thank you for your uh, comment, Janelle. And, and when we return back to um, uh, for council consideration, uh, perhaps that's something we can discuss. As a, a general rule, public comment is a time for comments to the council, but not for necessarily a back and forth between council and um, residents. We do hear your comments, and I will um, 
do my best to try to address it when it returns back to council for further consideration and discussion. Okay, thank you. Larry, is there any further public comment? I do not see any public comments, any more hands raised, and I do not see anything in email. Okay. All right, with that, we will bring it uh, back to the council for further uh, discussion and for, um, and for a vote. Um, so I, I just want to uh, start off, and I'll be brief, um, because I know that uh, Vice Mayor Brooks brought up the question about lifeguards, so that will be, um, I believe, agendized for a future meeting. I want to, again, uh, reiterate that the city had no, um, we were not the agency that made the determination that the beaches were closed, and we weren't the agency that made the determination that the beaches would be reopened. And so uh, we just received notice of that, I believe it was on Wednesday. Um, and so by then, um, it, it was only, well, that was yesterday. So um, we didn't have a lot of time for consideration of this, but um, I do appreciate the concern that was brought forward and, and Vice Mayor Brooks is ahead uh, of the curve on that one and, and asking for us to consider it at a future meeting. So it's definitely worth the discussion. So I appreciate the public comment on that. Um, bring it back to other council members for any further discussion on this. And if not, then I believe we need a motion uh, to determine that all hazards related to COVID-19 uh, still exist and there is a need to continue our action. Uh, Councilor Kabator. Motion to uh, recommend, uh, approve staff recommendation to continue uh, uh, necessary action. I'll second. We have a motion by Council Member Vatorf and a second by Vice Mayor Brooks. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Bertrand. Uh, thank you. Councilmember Bottorf. Aye. Councilmember Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. We will move on to item 8B, real property negotiations, easement grant to Pacific Gas and Electric Company at uh, City Hall property. And I'll turn it over to staff for staff report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is Steve Desperate, Public Works Director, and I will be sharing my screen here. Mayor Council, the item before you is uh, to grant an easement to Pacific Gas and Electric Company for the installation of equipment and an antenna on C City Hall property. This is in response to the public safety power shutoffs that we experienced last fall when uh, City Hall and properties along Capitol Avenue, Bay Avenue uh, with, were out, without power during those public safety power outages. A um, little background in fall, last year, as I mentioned, City Hall commercial and residential properties along Capitol Ave, Avenue and Depot Hill were affected by power shutoffs. These shutoffs were a result of high winds in the Santa Cruz Mountains, not necessarily local Capitol conditions. But the request of uh, city staff, PG&E, has developed a project to interconnect the grid serving the village with the grid to north of Capitol Avenue, which will uh, help alleviate that problem. And here's a map showing the outage areas and what they're proposing is a connection down here. This is Capitola Avenue, City Hall is right here. So the village all had power during these, these outages um, from a trestle up and then expanding as we went above, there was no power. Um, they're proposing to do an interconnect between these two um, microgrids, if you will, uh, that will as long as the local conditions allow, um, not affect, eliminate the outages in, the, in this mapped area. Um, in order to complete this project, PG&E would like to obtain an easement from, from the city to install an underground vault, above ground cabinet, and an antenna on City Hall property. And you can see here's a street view uh, looking at City Hall from Capitol Avenue. You can see where the proposed easement is located. 
Um, we, in discussions with PG&E, we asked them to look at other sites, um, mainly railroad uh, property, to see if there are an easement that would be less impactful to uh, the frontage of City Hall. And PG&E, unfortunately, was unable to secure any other easements. Uh, the railroad does not grant uh, utility easements um, to any utilities, so they're pretty, um, we're a definite no. They looked at some other properties, but due to, due to utility conflicts in front of, uh, in this general area, uh, was the only place that they were able to identify. This is a snapshot of, I don't know if it's exact, but very similar equipment. You can see this area here is the vault. This is the above ground SCADA cabinet that will be used, and this is a portion of the mast antenna. Um, this is what we will see in front of City Hall if we move forward with this. Um, easement details. The easement grants PG&E the right to construct, maintain, and operate this equipment. It grants them the right to trim, remove landscaping that may interfere with the equipment or their ability to access it. The city will be able to maintain some landscaping in the easement. And right now they have indicated, PG&E has indicated that they will let us paint the cabinet uh, with their prior approval. So we have to submit a, a proposal to them. Uh, painting cabinets is something we've done with our traffic signal cabinets throughout the city and also several of our uh, vaults along um, the Esplanade. Uh, concerns and benefits, so uh, that's certainly the biggest concern is the, uh, it's located right in front of the City Hall and Museum. It's going to be visible and it's permanent equipment that will remain there. Um, the easement also does not limit the amount or the size of the equipment pg can place on the easement. So at this point, um, pg e has indicated we could propose some language to them and we are working with the City Attorney to propose that language that would probably limit the equipment um, to anything necessary to continue uh, eliminating the power outages. Um, the benefits is obviously uh, the reduction of PSPS outages in Capitola. So our recommendation tonight is to authorize the city manager to negotiate the terms and execute an easement be granting Pacific Gas and Electric Company a non-exclusive utility easement for the installation of new underground box above ground cabinet and an antenna on city-owned property located at 420 Capitol Avenue, APN 351135, known as the City Hall property. As my report, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Steve. I'll pull up the participants panel here so I can get an idea if there's any questions. Oh, oh Mayor, if I may, um, excuse me. Um, Gina Arnold and Alexis Herrera are both uh, in attendance at tonight's meeting are unavailable. Uh, from pg &E to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Uh, it looks like we have Council Member Bertrand has a question, and then after that, we'll go to Council Member Story. So, Mayor, I'm concerned about if the city is planning to do any um, construction or development or any kind of changes to that property and how that would affect us working with pg &E. So, um, the, the easy answer is this is an easement we're granting to them. Um, if we wanted to move that equipment, we would have to both provide a new spot for it that would work for PG&E and potentially pay to relocate that equipment to them. So this is a, a definite um, burden on the property here. Well, um, do we have how much that would cost? Usually working with PG&E is pretty difficult at best. Um, it, it, it'd be, I do not have a cost, whatever it would potentially cost to move this equipment, no. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Story, you had a question? Yes, I did. Thank you, Mayor. Um, maybe a couple of questions. Steve, um, if we approve this grant of easement, um, what level of assurance do we have that we will no longer be subject uh, to those uh, power outages? Um, um, and um, my second question, um, a more technical question, and but since we're the grantor on the grant deed, um, I understand that PG&E is paying us $3,700 for the easement. 
but on the grant deed it says this is the conveyance where the consideration and value is less than a hundred dollars. So I was wondering if somebody could reconcile uh, those two uh, facts for me. Thank you. Councilman Starry, I'll ask one of the PTE representatives to address the first question. And regarding the second question, we will work with the city attorney's office to reconcile any difference between the, the offer and the easement fee. So Gina or Alexis, can you answer the question regarding uh, the likelihood that of, of us having an outage again here in this area? Thank you. Yeah, good evening. This is Alexis Herrera. I'm the project manager and program manager for the PSPS program um, at pg &E. So the reason that it was developed for this specific area was to eliminate or alleviate at least the impact of the PSPS that impacted you from that map. Um, we are very confident that if things progress like they did last year with the PSPS, which was a very kind of normal PSPS situation, that this would alleviate all of those outages within that area. Um, of course, we can't predict what might happen um, in the future for how PSPSs might act. Um, but the way that it was described, which is how the feed comes into the community, was very accurate. That was right on. And the feed that comes into the community, which is what was impacted, could very well likely be impacted again. And so in reaction to that, which is why we developed it where it was, we're, we're very confident that um, it's greatly going to minimize the impact, if not alleviate it altogether. And again, I just want to stress that we can't predict what the PSPS event will look like, but we're very confident that this will alleviate future PSPS events. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ms. Herrera, for that response. Appreciate it. Uh, Council Member Bertrand, do you have your hand up again? Uh, you're muted right now, Council Member Bertrand. Yes, I do. I do have another question there. Um, this may be um, completely out of blind ignorance, which I admit, but uh, why can't we just lease the uh, property uh, some long-term agreement? The issue I have is we've lost control over the use of our property by doing this particular easement. If we lease it, then we have some choice Uh, I'll start the answer and maybe uh, one of the pg &E representatives can um, help me out here. Uh, pg &E has a standard practice of only uh, investing the installation of equipment on permanent easements. That's what they've expressed to us and I don't think they would proceed uh, on anything with a permanent easement. That is correct. This, this project is solely at pg and &E's expense. And it can be very costly for us to do all of this installation work, um, not just the actual construction part of it, but the design and the management, and then ultimately the installation and the maintenance of this equipment falls solely on PG&E. And again, that's, that's very costly to PG&E to only then potentially be subject to have to remove this equipment. Um, so pg and &E does not enter into um, leases. This is a non-exclusive easement, which means that there is allowed to be a certain amount of things in that area, but we would not be able to enter into this agreement and put in this critical equipment without a full easement um, in lieu of a lease. Thank you. We don't see any further council comments. Uh, I, would, I would just, oh wait, no, we're on questions. Let's go to public comment now then. Um, with no further questions from the council, uh, we will bring this to public comment. Uh, so this is a chance for members of the public to address the council on this item specifically. Turn it over to Larry. Larry, I don't see anyone uh, on attendees, but maybe you could let me know if there's any emails that came in. You're right. I don't see any attendees. Let me check the emails. Um, I do not see any emails on this item. All right, then. Uh, with that, we're going to close public comment for this item, bring it back to the council. And switch back over here, Council Member Bator. Do you have a comment? I do, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I I think this is a great project. Uh, the fact that uh, pg &E has identified a way to a bridge this gap in our city that, that divided our city senselessly for power, I think, is fantastic. I, I think it should be mentioned that uh, this was a tremendous effort by the city manager and 
public works director to reach out to PG&E and to, uh, to make this happen. This is good for a lot of residents, a lot of businesses. This caused tremendous financial loss for some businesses and anguish of a lot of people. So uh, I, I, I feel the sense of Council Member Bertrand about giving this space away at City Hall indefinitely. But, you know, I think the gains far, far outweigh the, the unsightliness of this and future ramifications. I think it's uh, uh, something we can live with and, and work with down the road. Uh, like I said, the gains of this are, 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 are far too hard to measure. So with that, I'm going to make a recommendation to our motion to approve staff recommendation. I'll second that motion, and I do have a comment. Okay, we have a second by council, uh, excuse me, a motion by Councilmember Botworth and a second by Councilmember Bertrand. Uh, discussion continues. Go ahead, Councilmember Bertrand. Yeah, I'd like to echo um, Ed's comments in terms of the benefit to the community. Um, there are a lot of businesses. Uh, there's a, at least a couple of emails on that that lost uh, money due to the uh, brownouts, uh, not brownouts, the loss of power, excuse me. So that could have a significant impact. So I think this is something that's very beneficial for the community in general. Thank you, Steve, I believe, for reaching out to PG&E about this. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any additional council comments. Uh, I would just like to share that while uh, the council is, is not in the business of assigning work to any of our uh, committees, I imagine that should this um, uh, above ground power outlet box be painted, uh, that there may be some kind of input by the Art and Cultural Commission um, and I would ask if they are willing that we offer the opportunity for either some or all of the museum board of trustees to have some kind of involvement of that, um, just because it will be directly in front of the museum and there is some art there already with a specific seal. Um, so I, I would hope that um, we can at least offer them the opportunity to participate in this and uh, not necessarily require that they do. but. Um, I, I hope that as we move forward, that's something that um, staff will, will be willing to consider is offering the Historical Museum Board the opportunity to participate in deciding how the art uh, fits in with the rest of the museum there on site. And otherwise, I agree this is a, a great opportunity for the city to be less impacted um, as we were last year by the public safety uh, power shutoff. And I appreciate the work of the staff and of Alexis and uh, Jenna for uh, their work on this. Uh, so with that, if we have no additional council comments, and it doesn't look like we do, uh, we have a motion and a second. So can I have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Botorf. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you, Council. Motion carries unanimously. We're going to move on to item 8C, a resolution for the levy of Capitola Village and Morris Business Improvement Area Assessment for fiscal year 2021. Send it over to staff. Good evening, if I may. Um, go ahead. Before you start, Jim, I'm going to recuse myself since. Um, you know, I'm a business owner in the village that's subject to this assessment. So um, I'm going to recuse myself from this uh, action. Thank you, Council Member Story. All right. Uh, Jim? Okay, with that, uh, the next item before you is uh, to conduct our annual public hearing for consideration of the fiscal year 2021 uh, Capitola Village. Business Improvement Area Assessments, as well as their annual plan and budget. And with that, I will turn it over to Karin Hanna with the BIA to give a presentation. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, obviously, this is a very unique year for the BIA and all of Capitola and Capitola Village. And so I think I'm really most comfortable with responding to any um, questions or particular concerns that, that might occur to you because other than um, we're running a little late on electing new board members, that will happen next month. We uh, hopefully next month we'll be hiring a new communication manager after the tragic loss of Ben Kelly, our former um, communications manager. 
Um, events are obviously on hold. No one knows what's happening there. Um, we're not being aggressive about any advertising or social media promotion um, because we're not encouraging people to come from out of the area. Um, I believe as we get closer to the holidays, we might uh, think about advertising more to uh, locals than we do normally because our mission is uh, to promote Capital Village outside of the county, but we're not really um, pushing that right at the moment. And um, that's about it. I, I can. I, Anthony was supposed to be here, so I don't know if he's uh, signed in by phone and lurking somewhere. Um, because he um, was going to give a report on the street side dining. And um, so I, if, if it's possible, I'd love to just take any questions and see where we go from there. Thank you, Karen. Uh, does, are there any council members that have any questions? Vice Mayor Brooks, you have your hands up. Yeah, hands. thank you, Karen, for presenting today. Um, are you saying that we're going to hear from Anthony in a little while about the street side dining and how it's going? Uh, apparently, he has not been able to um, uh, log in. I, I don't know for what reason. So I'm certainly prepared to um, pass on the information that he has given me as a restaurateur. I thought it would be most appropriate for him to do that. But if he, if, um, you know, Larry would be able to see if he was there, and I doubt that he's there. I do I, see a raised hand. I'm not sure if it's him, Larry. That's what I was going to ask you. I'm going to see if this is Anthony. Yes. Okay. <laughs> is this I, Anthony at 408? Yes, this is Anthony. Yes, right. Anthony. All right. Would you like me to address the outside dining? Please, if you don't mind. Yeah. So basically the feedback we've gotten, we have several res residents, I mean, restaurants that are utilizing and they provided positive feedback. They've been able to extend the outdoor seating and some have seemed busy. Others, we haven't had utilizing it very much or at all. Um, the feedback I've gotten from them is either they have limited funds to, you know, purchase tables and chairs to put out there, or the other common one is they're too short staffed right now and they're not able to implement it with, you know, using the staff they have with the county COVID-19 guidelines in terms of cleanliness and sanitizing. Um, just, you know, a lot of people haven't come back to work. so kind of a mixed reviews um, for the ones that are using it, you know, good things so far. Others, you know, hopefully they'll get with it within the next couple of weeks or, you know, by the July 4th or so. Mayor Peterson, may, may I follow up with a question? Yes, please. Um, and are you, I, I'm not, I'm sure how you're allowed to use the funds in, in its entirety, but are you allowed to use the BIA funds to purchase tables or chairs or anything like that? to support the businesses who can't afford it right now? I mean, that's something that would have to be brought out to the board to be voted upon and see what you know type of funds are available. Um, you know, some of them, you know, it's something we can discuss with the businesses that want to do it, but that's kind of been the feedback. If you look on the Esplanade, there's probably about three or four spaces right there that aren't being utilized and maybe a couple more around the village. Um, you know, the thing is a short notice and getting people to kind of implement it quickly isn't, hasn't been the easiest thing. So I think right now everybody's trying to figure out their own business model one week at a time, to the best of their abilities, getting their staff back in place, following the COVID-19 guidelines. Now with the beach being open, that presents you know, new challenges and new hurdles that businesses can have to adapt to with an increase in the crowd. So, you know, hopefully we'll get some more feedback this next coming weeks on which ones we'll be able to, you know, open up the outdoor city or make the changes necessary. And how has, um, and maybe this could expand to Chief McManus too, are we seeing an influx of calls? Are you, have you heard that businesses have had to make many calls to support the, those regulations that are in place, like the mask wearing? Have, we, have you received any feedback about that? I mean, from what I know, most of the businesses are having fortunate themselves. I know uh, Zelda and the Margarita Bell have done a, an amazing job doing it themselves at the front door. Um, we're telling our customers the same thing, wearing masks. Most every business has the social distancing guidelines and the masks, you know, signs on their windows where it basically says no masks, no service, um, and implementing the best they can. It's not always the easiest. Not everybody wants to abide by those guidelines and rules, um, but... We're, we've been told not to serve them or allow them to order if they're not. 
And then my last question is about traffic. Um, we were we had some concerns about traffic kind of backing up and people slowing down to look at those uh, outdoor diners. Um, have you seen that to be an issue? Heard of any issues? I haven't seen any issue. Usually if I drive through the village and I go that way where there's some traffic, it's usually backed up due to somebody waiting for a parking spot to fill in, but I haven't heard any feedback regarding uh, too much traffic or backing up and that's going on. And, and if I may, <clears throat> Vice Member Brooks, I can uh, comment on the traffic piece of it as well. <clears throat> I think the, the congestion with the vehicles, certainly um, a couple of weeks ago when we introduced the outdoor dining, was a little bit more um, <clears throat> of concern than it seems to be currently. Uh, but there is a little more congestion because the vehicles are traveling at a slower rate. Uh, but I agree with Anthony that the majority of those cars are lining up waiting for available parking spots. And it, uh, we, we try and monitor it, as I've talked about previously, uh, each day because there are times when we need to restrict access to the Esplanade from further vehicles because the congestion of vehicles and potentially pedestrians crossing the street is just, just too much for a period of time. That usually only takes about 15 minutes to clear. Um, but I think that it's very manageable. I'm not greatly concerned about the congestion. Um, the, the shorter or, or the um, uh, reduced width entering the Esplanade um, is the probably most difficult area, but it's not unmanageable at all uh, from the PD's perspective. Great, thank you. Those are all my questions. All right. I don't see any further questions from council, so we will open public comment on this item. If there's any member of the public that would like to speak to council, I'll turn it over to Larry. I, I do see someone with a with a comment. Brief hand, Janelle. Hi, I just have a question. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, your your board for going ahead and approving or recommending a reduction to the assessment fees this year, 25%. That's very appreciated for the businesses that are undergoing such extreme stresses. And then the second thing that came to mind while hearing the discussion was that it sounds like there's a need for some of the businesses potentially to have assistance with the purchase of tables. And I don't know if that's something your council would like to consider uh, the use of the CARES fund or the CDBG funds that, that might be an opportunity to offer that funding for those businesses that don't have available to purchase their outdoor seating. That, that's the end of my comments. Thank you. Larry, do we have any, I don't see any additional uh, hands up. Yes, do I, I don't see any hands and I do not see any emails on this item. <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, we will bring it back to council. I uh, just want to acknowledge that we um, we are considering the use of our CDBG CARES Act funding and, and how that will be used. And a portion of it um, will be uh, uh, for uh, small loans or grants for uh, our, our business community. Um, and that's something that we're still working on the details of, but that is a possibility for them to uh, choose to use that fund if they receive it um, for that purpose. Um, I'm going to see if there's any additional, let's come back to the panelists, any additional comments from council members? Uh, Councilor Rabatorf. Oh, you're still muted, Councilor Rabatorf. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the, the, uh, the traffic that was brought up. Uh, I think that one thing we need to, to recognize is that uh, with the opening of the beaches, I expect the traffic in the village to substantially increase. Uh, so this will give us a true test as to, uh, you know, uh, monitoring how traffic flows through there and how the congestion may affect uh, the outside dining. I know that I had proposed a, uh, a possible alternative to the express lane when we first set up the plan. I'm not ready to recommend that. I'm going to be watching this. I think we're all going to be watching to see how the opening of the beaches affects everything. And uh, that I just want to let the BI know that that, that that option, at least in my mind, is still on the table. Uh, but we're going to have to watch and see how, uh, how, how the opening of the beaches and how this will put us into full swing uh, and see how that goes. And like I said, if, if, it, if it turns out 
that it does create a problem for the outside dining. That's something I would like to bring back to the council in, in our next uh, COVID update. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bobster. Any additional uh, comments from council? Okay, seeing none, we were looking for a motion. Let me make sure I'm on the right item here. Yes, so we were looking for a motion uh, to accept the Capitola Village Wharf Business Improvement Area uh, Annual Plan and Budget. I so move. I'll second. We have a motion by Councilmember Bertrand and a second by Councilmember Botworth. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Botworth. Aye. Councilmember Story is recused. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries uh, with four, um, four voting in favor and one uh, recusal. Moving right along, uh, do we have Councilmember Story back with us? There he is. All right. Thank you. We're going to move on to item 8D, consider a resolution allocating the 2021 road maintenance and rehabilitation account funds. Good evening, Mayor Council, once again. I'm going to reshare my screen. Mayor Council, item 4A tonight is um, adopting a resolution regarding our road maintenance and rehabilitation funding that we get from the state of California. Um, a little background here, the road, the road maintenance and rehabilitation account, also known as the RMRA, was enacted in 2017 and provides dedicated road funds to the city annually. The RMRA requires an annual adoption of a resolution specifying the projects to be funded. In fiscal year 2021, the uh, city is expected to receive a little over $193,000 from this funding. A little history on the, on the funding. Uh, the last two years of the RMRA funding uh, went toward the recently completed Park Avenue sidewalk project. Uh, looking at other sources of, um, or use of project money, not necessarily RMA, is the last significant road paving project the city has completed it was in 2018. So two years ago, we did a $350,000 citywide slurry. In 2016, we did a significant $1.3 million paving project on Park Avenue, Kennedy Drive, and Monterey Avenue. And also in 2016, um, this was in conjunction with a sanitary sewer project that went through the area we did pave Rosedale Avenue at the price of $267,000. Those are the improvements we've made uh, to the pavement in the city of Capitola the last few years. Um, looking at road funding in general, the city has three sources of dedicated road funding coming in in 2021. Of course, there's the RMRA. There's also the Measure D RTC funds, which we anticipate uh, $250,000 coming in. And we've also, this year, the RTC granted the Regional Transportation Improvement Program funds on a um, formula basis rather than on a competitive grant basis. So uh, over a three-year period, we have $505,000 um, from that fund, which we can spend on this project. We can spend it whenever we want. We have about three years to spend it. Um, so that gives us almost $950,000 to spend on road funding this year. Um, these are transportation funding. These can be, as we did in the past, on sidewalk improvements. We built pre bike lanes with this. We have done some paving with this money in the past. But given that we're supposed to be spending about $750,000 a year on just pavement improvements in the city of Capitola to maintain our pavement condition, at this point, we're recommending that we combine all three of these sources and develop a pavement management program project. It can be more than one project as we move forward. 
Um, but I think it should all, my recommendation is that all goes into pavement restoration. Um, looking forward on how I want to move forward with this project. Uh, based on the input received tonight from council, staff will complete a preliminary repair alternative study and cost analysis on the identified street segments. Um, I would say over the last five years, uh, the way cities and jurisdictions are protecting their streets has changed. It used to be you either slurry sealed it or you dug it up and put down new asphalt. Um, we have seen a, a change in that, uh, not for the worst streets, but some of the, the middle ground streets where you can do uh, more different kinds of layers and, and add different layers, a rubber layer or a bigger rock layer on top of some slurry. So um, we need to go through and do that analysis on whatever streets we decide to include in this project tonight, and then we'll return it uh, when we've done that analysis, and that'll finalize the scope of work. Uh, in the resolution, we're going to identify a bunch of streets that we're going to um, look at, but it's always possible for us to make, either amend the resolution or as long as the streets are included on what we build, we will be fine with the state. Um, staff has proposed a list in the agenda report, and I'll be going that in a minute, but just be aware that the cost of the streets listed in the agenda report exceed what our funding is already. Uh, council certainly can add or modify this list. Council can tell me what their priorities are. And uh, adoption of the resolution does, do, does need to occur tonight. We are required to file a report by the middle of July with the state to secure our funding. So these are the lists that were uh, projects that were included in the agenda report. Uh, 42nd Avenue, Diamond Street, and Ruby Court uh, were all projects that um, street improvements that were delayed. Uh, they were funded at one point, but due to increase in cost, uh, were taken out of a project. You can see here the pavement condition index. Again, that's from zero to 100. 100 is a brand new street, like Bromer is now. Um, and so zero to 100, and you can see these streets are uh, in need of repairs and repayment. The cost of that uh, from an estimate that was done, I believe two years ago was $1.3 million. So we're at 950, so we're, we, it may be possible that we can find other treatments for these streets that doesn't require uh, removal and replacement, but we need to look into that. 41st Avenue is always something I think we should look at funding. Um, Highway 1 to Capitol Road is something we should look at, uh, especially from Claire's to Highway 1. But of uh, high importance, I think, is addressing the intersections at Claire's and Capitol Road with 41st Avenue. I estimate those, just repairing those intersections, uh, $400,000. I've estimated pavement condition index on this. Um, our report doesn't break out intersections. When we look at it, it gives bigger sections. But I'm sure all of you have traveled those intersections and can see the wear and tear that has gone on on those intersections, and they're, they're pretty dire need of some attention. Uh, Claire Street is another uh, project that has a PCI of 18. Um, we did apply for some CDBG grant money several years ago that we were unsuccessful on. Uh, we do have some money set aside in the CIP already. Um, that's to do some pedestrian improvements, but to pave it, it would be about $1.2 million if we need to repave it. Again, we need to look at and see if there's an alternate uh, rehabilitation method that we could do. And then Bay Avenue and Capitol Avenue are both uh, quite heavily traveled streets uh, getting from the freeway to the village. Both of them are uh, in need of repairs. Both of them have a PCI of about 80 at this point. Um, certainly there's some failed sections in there that we would need to get into, but it's something where a slurry seal or some advanced uh, surfacing may work on those. Unfortunately, I, I, I can't give you an estimate of what those would cost at this time. Um, looking at additional considerations the council may want to do is um, develop another citywide slurry seal project like we've done in the past. So we usually run between three and four hundred thousand uh, dollars. The streets would need to be determined. Uh, we would uh, go through our, our list and, and look at the best ones to identify kind of on a citywide basis. And if the council wants, they could set the uh, percent of funding that we want to put into that slurry seal project. Uh, the council can also identify other street segments they want to want me to add to the list that we study. So this is a map uh, from 2017. Uh, so last time we did a 
thorough study of our street segments. It shows the pavement condition index. Um, green is good, all the way down to red is uh, very poor. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of where we're at. I think the overall the pavement condition index in the city is about a 60, which is in the good to very good uh, conditions. Our residential streets are doing better than our arterial streets. Um, but uh, So this is the map if we want to refer to any streets as we're going through our deliberations tonight. So our recommendations tonight is to receive direction from council on the, the street list for this project and adopt the proposed resolution allocating the 2021 road maintenance and rehabilitation account funds to engineering and construction of pavement management program project. That's my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Uh, council members, are there any questions? I see council member Bertrand has his hand up. Yeah, I was just wondering with the recent work on Capitola Avenue for the sewer redo, um, how does that affect the, uh, the, the, the index? Uh, right now it's at 80. Uh, what would it be now, do you think? Well, they did trenching, which lowers the index, but they will be slower to see it. So I see that as a net wash. So we'll probably remain in the 80 area with that project. Okay, so in a sense, it will get a complete, re well, in terms of slurry seal, it will look pretty good. Correct. Um, the other thing I was wondering about is Claire's. You know, that's been on the middle burner <laughs> for a long time. And you're proposing for a complete redo of Claire's. Uh, the thing I've been talking about is, you know, and we received a lot of letters about this, is we need crosswalks there. Um, the condition of the road is one thing. Um, I'm not sure that the speeding is such an issue. I haven't, uh, last time it was reported there was no accidents. Maybe the police chief could talk about that in speeding citations. But the main thing I'm worried about, especially for um, the residents that are elderly, uh, there's just no crosswalks, and we really need those. So that was going to be a Claire's light. I don't know where that stands at this point. So there was money identified in last year's project. There was $150,000 put into Claire's pedestrian improvements. We actually have a project that uh, scope that has been put together. Um, we are just trying to formulate how best to hold a community meeting at this time. It's kind of been held back because of the, uh, the pandemic we're in, holding a a workshop. Um, we're working on the best way to proceed with that, but we can proceed with the pedestrian uh, Claire's Light project w without any additional funding at this time. So another question. So we could do the intersections at 41st and, um, excuse me, Wharf Road and Claire's Light uh, for the whole street, independent projects? We could do the pedestrian improvements and the intersection. The pedestrian improvements on Claire's are already funded. Regardless of tonight's funding, so we could, and then the intersections. Okay, and thank the you. intersections would be part of the pavement management program tonight. Thank you. Any additional questions from council? Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, thanks, Steve, for the report. Um, I'm just wondering why would projects be presented and included in the resolution if we can't afford them if they, you know, that there's more than $985,000. At this point, as I mentioned in my report, we want to evaluate the exact cost. Um, I don't think there's enough money to, for example, pay, repay Claire Street. But there may be some other um, treatment surfaces that we could do if, if that's the priority of the council that we, we could afford. And I would like to be able to do that further analysis and um, report back to council as we finalize it. Um, I, I will apologize that this resolution is coming to you in such kind of late notice. Um, we, we kind of uh, flipped with the pandemic. It should have come to you earlier. Unfortunately, we need to get the resolution to the council. So I'm putting in all the streets we can think of that we think we want to cover, and then we will address and come back and finalize that scope at a later date. And going back to your original slide, so there's going to be at least one project on there that will be within the 985,000 because there were some unknowns and then the others were over a million. So we're hoping that one of them will fall within that budget. 
Yes. And then can you tell me um, what, so this I think was before I, I was, uh, I've been on council, was there a pending bike project, bike lane project that wasn't completed or was that all those green lanes, did that, was that completed in Capitola or was that just like, I'm not sure how that worked out, but I know that we could use these funds for that, for those purposes for green bike lanes. And I was just curious why that wasn't on there. So the green, we did complete one of the first projects and I apologize, I don't remember if it was Measure D or SB1 money, but we did use the first year of those dedicated funds for the red, the green bike lane project that is at the highway uh, overcrossings on 41st, Porter and uh, Bay Porter and Park Avenue. So that was about $150,000 worth of green lane projects that we did complete uh, approximately two or three years ago. And do any of those need to be repainted that we would need to put into the resolution just in case? Uh, no, I actually think they're fine now. Uh, we are adding more green bike lanes as part of the Bromer project, which is wrapping up right now. Um, and we do not have any other identified areas as we go through and do these projects, um, pavement projects, we will analyze whether a green bike lane would be appropriate. I would be included with the funding. So I don't think we need to separate out at this point any green lane projects. I think we may have, Vice Mayor Brooks may have frozen there, so we'll see if she can come back online. Um, any additional questions from council? I do. What was that, Vice Mayor Brooks? Was that the end of your questions, or did you have um, more questions? All right. We'll I have back. a question. I'm all done. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Council Member Bertrand. No, I have another question. And um, I was thinking about the intersection of 41st with Claire's. Uh, we've had a lot of complaints about um, the turning right at the signal. And, you know, that was sort of a comment when we first changed that intersection, mostly coming from the direction of um, the bank and Burger King, uh, changing how the, uh, the turns went. Um, the other thing I notice is that coming out from behind um, the bank, that, that street, that sort of that little alleyway, rather, you know, a lot of people are always waiting there and trying to make a left turn or a right turn. And so if you look at that intersection, can you um, extend that out a little bit so that it goes down to maybe Trotter so we could maybe improve that intersection if, if that's a possibility? So it's part of the Claire's the larger Claire's project, we did do an analysis of that intersection. Um, I don't think we made a whole lot of changes. It's, it's a very busy intersection, um, a significant amount of traffic to it. I mean, 41st is the busiest non-highway street in, in the county, and that intersection is probably one of the busier intersections in the county. Um, the safety improvements when we put the no right on red and changed the turn lanes have significantly decreased the traffic accidents at that intersection. So from that point, I realize it may be frustrating, but it's, it's safer, which is always our primary goal. Um, we can certainly look at it if we do do an improvement project uh, in that area and make sure we're, it's as efficient as we can make it. Okay. But, you know, coming out from that parking lot, that's an issue. I've, I've seen a lot of problems there, you know. I walk that way a lot, so that's why I notice them. So, we'd be happy to look at it. Thank you. All right, um, Steve, I have a quick question. Um, right now on uh, Cap Ave, there's some construction going on, uh, kind of from uh, City Hall to where it meets uh, Bay, essentially. Um, and, and I'm not sure exactly what's happening, some kind of underground work it looks like. Um, do we anticipate that the pavement there is gonna be as good as it was before the project when they're done? And I only bring that up now because it's, as it stands right now, that it's, um, it's a nightmare on my suspension for my car, so I don't know about anyone else. Do we, do we anticipate that it's gonna go back to the way it was before the project in that particular strip of, of street? So I would say it's gonna be better. Um, so it was a, a county sewer project replacing a, a uh, maintenance problem that they were having with the sewer line. 
Uh, we have worked with the contractor uh, and uh, patched the worst areas on that street that weren't even out, were outside their trench, uh, something the city worked with the contractor to do. And then they will be slurry sealing it uh, the entire length from City Hall up to Bay Avenue. Okay. Um, all those improvements will will make it smoother, but they're you know it's still a, a, an older road, and that's why it's kind of included in this project list that I've proposed tonight. Um, but it will be better; it won't be worse. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Seeing no additional questions from council, we'll bring this item to public comment. Uh, are there any members of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Mayor Peterson, I do not see any hands raised. And I do not see any emails. All right. Uh, in that case, we will bring it back to the council for uh, deliberation and a vote. And I think I saw Councilmember Bottor's hand, and then we'll go to Councilmember Story. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Steve, thanks for uh, putting this project together. I know this is always uh, tough to figure out what to do. Um, I have concerns. You know, uh, I know you're going to give us a presentation about what, what projects you think are best. But uh, I know you and I have talked over the years about the uh, 42nd Dime and Ruby Court area. And my concern is the further deterioration of that area uh, to a point where, you know, it, it, it can't be saved. So uh, for whatever it's worth, I, I hope uh, that the, I would like to see the money go in that area. And if the, if the money's not enough to do all three, as Vice Mayor Brooks brought up, uh, even the deletion of Ruby Court would allow the other areas to get done. But uh, I, I hear you lobbying for the uh, for the players and 40 and uh, uh, Capitol Road intersections. But uh, I do know that that area is is crumbling, and I I just worry about further deterioration. So for my two cents, uh, I, I like that project. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Story. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, well, one, I'd, I'd like to move that we accept um, staff recommendation. Um, uh, but um, I would like to make a pitch for FANMAR. Um, it's for, I think, for two decades. I mean, the map that Steve just showed, you know, it's red. Uh, it's been red for 20 years. Um, and, and as a potential project, I know later we'll be trying to decide, you know, how to prioritize them and which ones. Um, maybe the other ones will have more priority. But I, I think that, that Van Marsh should be on the list. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Story. I just briefly would like to uh, agree with that. It's, it's in red on that map, and uh, we'll have to have further discussion uh, with the city attorney on if I would be able to uh, vote on that based on my proximity to Mar, or if I'm allowed to continue discussion uh, because it's an overall pavement management plan. But uh, before we get to that, I'll, I'll go to uh, Council Member Bertrand. I'd like to second the motion so you can continue there. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes, we have a, a motion and a second. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mary. Um, so I think this list is pretty good. Um, you know, I'd like to see the analysis as the uh, Director of Public Works is uh, promising us. Um, you know, I believe that um, Capitol Avenue is going to be very serviceable with um, the arrangements that we have with sanitation, and you're already working with the contractors. So I'm glad you're you're doing that. Bay Avenue um, is is is, an, is a street that you know we've had plans. I remember when we were thinking about what to do with that street and having it like a more of a boulevard look. Is that something? that would be in your plans or just a straight, I'm sorry, I forgot this question, or would it just be a straight repaving and, and striping type thing? Right now it, it would be a, re, a pavement rehabilitation, um, probably a, a pavement and striping. It would not be a streetscape project. We do have in our long range plans, the uh, roundabout with the intersection of Bank Capital Ave, so we would, we would not want to spend a lot of time and energy at the intersection, it extends a little bit beyond the intersection, so we would be focusing on the parts that aren't part of that project and would be, because of the funding we have available, focused on pavement. Okay. So um, my main focus is on the streets that have a lot of um, traffic, 
Um, you know, 40, uh, excuse me, Claire's is to me an issue that's a safety issue rather than just a uh, surface road condition. And it gets a lot of traffic. So the lot of traffic and the issue of safety is a major problem for me. I think Bay Avenue is similar. Um, we have a population um, at the um, at the housing unit off of Bay that go across the street to uh, Knob Hill. Um, I've had letters in the past about that, and also one of our uh, our, our, our capital policemen got knocked off a bike there. So there's other issues there that I think come up too in terms of safety. So I'm definitely supporting Claire's and Bay Avenues high high use and safety related. So for the final analysis, I look to your analysis of how much things are going to cost, because that's the ultimate issue. Steve, can you clarify for us? Do we need to, you said this needs to happen tonight. So do we need to in just generally authorize um, uh, the, the pavement management program project, or do we need to give you specific streets right now? There are streets listed in the existing uh, resolution, and we, we should list the streets that we intend to do the analysis on in this list. So if we want to add Sandmar, we should add that to the resolution. Okay. Um, okay, before I make further comment on that, um, I'm going to ask our city attorney, uh, because of my proximity to Sandmar, is it appropriate for me to ask um, for a, is it appropriate for me to, to continue uh, discussing the need for, for FAMAR and to ask for um, a, a change to the motion, a friendly amendment to the motion to include FAMAR considering my proximity and living to it? Um, so anytime I'm asked a complex question, uh, right before or during the meeting, my response is as conservative as possible because complex issues are tricky and I would much rather give you more conservative advice than less. And so my advice would be, um, having not had the opportunity to fully analyze the question, that you should um, either not request that, or if one of your fellow council members would like to request it, you should recuse yourself from for the discussion. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, this is a tough one because, I mean, technically all of us, based on where we live in the city, are probably in proximity to one of these streets, so that's difficult. So I guess... Um, I, I see Councilmember Bator has his hand up again. Was that a new? That, that's new, Mayor, Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think that the list that uh, Steve has put together is, is, is a very good list. It covers streets that serve a large number of people or either are high traffic. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we're only going to be able to do maybe one of those groups. My concern about Sanmar is that, and I think Steve can expound on this, the, the nature of the asphalt on Sanmar is beyond repair. Uh, Sanmar is a total rebuild. And I, I, if, if there was a number that would come up, is at least this price per foot. Uh, the price per foot for doing Sanmar is outrageous. And it serves, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to gander a guess, maybe 70, 80 homes at the most, probably not even that many. Uh, I don't think we get bang for the buck on that. That's one of those things where, where if some grant comes along for some downtown village street or some something that we qualify for, but I just don't think it's a prudent investment of our money at this time. When, when there's, as Jacques mentioned, you know, we have some concerns if we commit to Claire's Avenue. Uh, I think that's something we could all justify because of home and volume of traffic, whereas, uh, you know, the traffic on Sanmar, uh, is, is not that much, and like I said, it doesn't serve that many residents. And Steve, I, I would like you to weigh in on what the anticipated cost of a Sanmar rebuild is. Thank you. Councilman Bogorski, uh, I don't recollect the final cost. One of the issues with uh, addressing Sanmar is the need to address drainage issues along that street. Right now, it meanders uh, more than anything. So we did have a preliminary design that uh, addressed the, the pavement or uh, the drainage on there. 
It also connects to Terrace, which is in equally bad shape and in parts of San Jose, so it's easy to expand that project. Um, as I recollect, the estimate for doing the drainage improvements and estimate for Fanmar is somewhere in the million dollar range. Thank you. Um, I have a comment. I believe Mayor Peterson might be frozen. No. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and jump in. Go ahead, um, Council Member Bertrand. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, yeah, I echo Ed's comments, and you know, I hate to say it, the other reason why I'm supporting different projects other than FanMar is mostly uh, safety and how many cars actually use a road. So in, in the sense of how many people or vehicles will benefit. And so that's sort of my, my take on things at this point. It looks like Mayor Peterson was back for a second, but it, she's no longer back with us. Um, so I see council member story hand up. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, can you hear me now? Um, yeah. Thank you, Ed. Um, I just wanted to respond to the comment about Fanmar. I had uh, asked that it be included as a potential uh, item on the list. My apologies. I think I, I lost everyone there. Sir. Yeah, you're back. You're back now. Um, but, you know, this is what I've heard about Fanmar for the last 20 years. We can't fix it because it's in too bad a shape. Based on that lo uh, logic, you'd never consider it, and you'd never do it, and and it just gets in worse and worse of shape. Um, so I think all we're talking about is putting it on a list of potential projects and to disregard it because it would be too hard to do it or because you prefer some other locale um, and and to you know just dismiss this out of hand as not even being up for consideration i just don't um get or agree with the logic of that if it's not such a bad shape then we should be dealing with it and not ignoring it and throwing our hands up thank you so i would like to include with the motion that fanmar be included Thank you, Council Member Story. Council Member Bosworth, you were the second on that motion. I, I'm not okay with accepting that on the list. So the motion dies for for lack of a second. I'm going to go ahead and um, make a friendly uh, amendment to include Fanmar to the resolution. Um, I'll go ahead and make a motion for the recommended action to include Sanmar to the resolution. Um, and that's my recommendation. Am I cutting out? There it goes. It's open for a second at this time. So Vice Mayor Brooks, my understanding is is that I, Mayor Peterson is in the waiting room as an attendee. So it may be possible for the moderator to bring Vice um, Mayor Peterson back on. I just promoted her to panelist. Um, let's see, but I don't see her at this time. I'm going to go ahead and continue since we have um, Council Member Story's hand up. Oh, if you were um, looking for a second to that friendly amendment or asking whether the mover or the motion accepts the friendly amendment, I'll do either or both. Thank you. And then this is for our city manager, um, 
Shall we go to roll call or should we wait for our mayor to return? I, Larry, did you see Mayor Peterson on the attendee list? I, I see, I saw her and promoted her, but I don't see her anymore. She's definitely having some communication issue with wherever she is. So, I don't see her back on as attendee either. Well, given oh, the there she is. I'll give it a second. Mayor Peterson, you are muted. Yes, I'm back now. Sorry about that. I had some internet problems and I tried to rejoin, but it was joining me in as a, an attendee and not a, a participant. So I, I am back now. My apologies. No problem. I'm just going to catch you up. Um, there is a motion on the table to include Sanmar to the resolution. And we were waiting for you um, to come back. Okay. So we have a motion and a second or just a motion? We have a motion and a second. Okay. Uh, in that case, uh, I think out of abundance of caution, because I'm right down the street from Fanmar, I will recuse myself from this vote and I will hand it off to you, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, to uh, continue this particular vote. Thank you, Mayor. We'll go ahead and go to roll call. Thank you. Councilmember Bertrand? No. Okay. Councilmember Bator? No. Council member Story? Yes. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. And the mayor is recused, so that does not pass. It's tied. Okay, so we can go back to deliberations at this point. Does anyone have any comments? Um, I see Council Member Botsworth can raise. Motion to uh, approve staff recommendation as, as written. I'll second that. Okay. okay, we have a first and second. Can we have a roll call, please? Yes, Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Botorf. Aye. Councilmember Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Thank you. I'm the mayor is recused. Oh, uh, uh, nope. oh excuse me. I'm, I'm so not sorry. Gonna... I apologize. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. So this passes. Thank you. All right. And thank you for your patience with me. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, let's move on. Uh, we're going to move on to 8E now, uh, approving the plan specifications and construction estimate for the flume and jetty rehabilitation project. Once again, good evening. One more item from me tonight. Sharing my screen. <clears throat> so my final item tonight with you is the uh, approval of the Slim and Jetty Real Rehabilitation Project, approving the plan specifications and estimate and authorize, authorizing. Uh, to advertise for construction bids. Uh, a little background, the Capital Improvement Program project list includes three projects that are funded by the Measure F uh, funded uh, Measure F funds. This includes the Wharf Rehabilitation Project, repairs to the flume and repairs to the jetty. The flume and jetty repairs, uh, since they're both on the beach, have been combined into a single project, and the pertinent plans and specific specifications are all complete and the project is ready to bid. The work project has recently completed its CEQA review and clearance, and we are now entering the permit permitting stage for that project. We anticipate that will take another year to get all the permits, at which point we will be ready to proceed with that project. Uh, the flume and jetty scopes and estimate. Uh, the flume, the goal of the project is to stop leakage in and out of the flume caused by cracks in the concrete, and also to uh, stop leakage that flows underneath the flume, uh, resulting in sinkholes on top of the flume. Right now, we need to go over the flume every morning to make sure uh, we don't have any sinkholes. We're also doing a repair to the structure, uh, taking off the top of the flume, for, uh, last probably 40 feet, and reinstalling it. That is heavily worn as uh, that's exposed to the waves. The uh, flume improvements are projected to cost $560,250. 
The JD project is to reestablish uh, the rock pile as it is to its original design size. Over the years, it has um, uh, the rocks have settled into the, the sand and mud and it reduced its effectiveness. Uh, we will be restacking displaced rocks that the contractor is able to grab and put on there, and he'll also be importing new additional rocks. The uh, estimate for the jetty repairs is $238,250, bringing the total project to $798,500. Um, in 2019, the city submitted a grant to the Department of Boating and Waterways or Division of Boating and Waterways for beach restoration and erosion control uh, funding. Uh, the FLUMA, at that time in February 2019, we agreed to hold off on awarding uh, to bidding the project to see if we were successful in the grant award. Um, currently, the proposed budget does not include any funding for this program, and it's unlikely that any changes at this late date, given the state of the state budget with the COVID impacts, uh, that the, that funding program will be funded. Uh, if they do go forward with a future year program funding, uh, we would have to resubmit an application. So that would be at least another two year wait. Um, so staff is now recommending that we proceed with the project using Measure F funds. Looking at the fiscal impacts, um, the existing funds, uh, this is cash available, nothing has been expended. Uh, this doesn't include any, include any extended funds. So the swim has a balance of 396,000. The jetty has 543,000, bringing that subtotal of swim and jetty funds to $940,065. The wharf has about $950,000 uh, in it, leaving a total of $1.9 million available for these Measure F funds. Um, the construction, as we said, for the swim and jetty is estimated at $798,500. We will to do, need to do some significant monitoring for wildlife and wildlife impacts during the project. We estimate that will cost $40,000. And we've included in here a 20% contingency, which brings us slightly over the amount for the Fleming Jetty, but certainly um, if we have the war funding, we have, we have sufficient funds to move forward with the project at this time. So the project schedule is approving the plans and specifications. That's tonight's meeting. Uh, we have scheduled the bid opening for July 29th. Uh, we will bring a contract award to the council on August 27th. And the, the scheduling for the construction is a little different. Usually when we award a street project or a sidewalk project, you know, we start within a month or so of awarding a contract and have a certain amount of working days. So it's going to be a little different because we're working in the beach environment. The first thing is we need to wait until the first rain to open up the creek so that the flume is no longer in use as it is today. That allows the contractor to get in and work on the flume without uh, impacting the flows. So that's usually that opening of the creek usually happens in October or November at the latest. Um, and then because they're going to, have to be working in you know, storm and in tide, tidal environment, um, they may have to stage different parts of work at different times, and we've given them a completion time to complete the project prior to next summer, so May of 2021. We anticipate each project to take about a month in and, in and of itself, so um, depending on how the contractor and weather and tides all work out, it's two months worth of work, somewhere between uh, November, we anticipate, and May. So our recommendation tonight is to approve the plan specification and construction estimates for the Flume and Jetty Rehabilitation Project, authorize the Public Works Department to advertise for construction bids, and set the bid opening date for June, July 29, 2020 at 11 a.m. That's my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Steve. Apologies. I'm trying to do this on my phone now so that my internet doesn't give out again. My data can, can back it up, but it makes it a little little bit trickier on my end. So thank you, uh, thank you, Steve. We will uh, bring this now to council um, questions and we'll see, I might have to uh, rely on one of our staff members to tell me if someone's got their hand raised now um, because I'm on my phone and I cannot see that. I will try to join from my laptop in the meantime, um, but if one of our staff members could let me know if any of the council members uh, have their hands raised for questions. 
I don't see any hands raised at this time. Okay. Uh, if there's no questions from council, we will bring this to public comment. Mayor Peterson, I do not see any hands up in the Zoom meeting, and I do not see any emails on the side. Okay. Then we'll bring it. I think we lost Mayor Peterson again. <laughs> okay, so we'll bring it back to council deliberation. I see council member Botchor's hand up. Uh, I'll motion to approve staff recommendation. I second. Great, we have a first and a second. Can I have a roll call please? Yes, council member Bertrand. Aye. Council member Botchor. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And is the mayor back? Okay. Thank you, okay, Mayor so that motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Council. And now we're moving on to item 8F. And this is Katie's item. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Hopefully, it's back for now. Thanks, Katie. Oh, there you are. Um, okay, so this evening I'm going to present to you an update on SB 743. Can you see my slides? Okay. Okay. Um, and SB uh, 743, I'll give you an overview of level of service and how it's how under CEQA, the new um, evaluation will be under vehicle miles traveled. Just a quick um, a quick reminder on CEQA projects, which will cause a significant environmental impact, should not be approved under CEQA as proposed if there are feasible alternatives or mitigated measures that would lessen those effects. Um, this evening, I think uh, we're going to get into the details. Really, it would be great to give you a 101 on CEQA first, but I think this first slide, just knowing that what we're really talking about is whether or not there's a significant environmental impact associated with the project and how we're going to review that in terms of transportation in the future. That's really what the overall goal is here for this presentation. So we'll start off with level of service. This is level of service is how we currently review traffic under CEQA. Um, it's a measure of delay or congestion. So when you're stuck at a red light or you wait three times before you get through a traffic light, that's a very low level of service. Um, under CEQA, auto delay and congestion is currently an environmental impact. As of July 1st, that will no longer be the standard. So as I mentioned, there's a grading system of A through F. The longer the wait or, um, the, or delay, the lower the grade. So an LOS of F is failure. And on the slide, as you can see, an LOS of A is kind of the early days of COVID, I would say, in Santa Cruz County. And now LOS of F is, you know, what we've experienced for a few years along Highway 1, and we hear that regularly at our interchange on 41st Avenue. Um, so, and typically under LOS, um, if you widen the streets, your LOS improves. So. But under the state, there's now a movement to go to vehicle miles traveled under CEQA. So under vehicle miles traveled, what we're looking at is the, just as it states, the amount of miles that are traveled uh, and it's per the type of land use. So on the first slide, you're seeing a home and to calculate vehicle miles traveled, you would look at within this home, there's three residents. Um, there's a child going to school, there are two adults, one who goes shopping, the other who goes to work, 
um, when they calculate the vehicle miles traveled for this family, their vehicle miles traveled is the average of 16.7 between the three um, residents. And another, the same idea for vehicle miles traveled, that would be for a new home going in. This would be for a new office going in. When we look at a new office, we're going to look at the employee trip um, to and from the office, and that depends on the number of employees based on the size of the establishment. We'll look at the customer trip to an office, as well as suppliers that um, are bringing goods and supplies to the office. So within this example, um, there's 20 vehicle miles traveled per employee when they um, do the calculations. So under, and so vehicle miles traveled is really looking at each land use and the cumulative miles, and it really looks at the environmental impact. So what is SB 743? It was enacted in 2013. Um, the state guidelines and rulemaking process took place between 2014 and 2018. Um, in 2018, the Office of Planning and Research adopted the rules. Um, it stayed, and within that, there was a conversion from LOS standards within CEQA to vehicle miles traveled. It becomes effective, as I stated earlier, on July 1, 2020. So under the CEQA determination under the new OPR guidance, the focus is on vehicle miles traveled, and a project's effect on the automobile delay shall not constitute a significant impact, and as it has in the past. Um, what vehicle miles does, this, this shift and the goal of SB 743, it promotes infill development, so within your city cores, allowing development to take place within the core. And um, it also focuses on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, so not sending your development to the outskirts of your city, it, and it doesn't no longer support sprawl. So look at the amount of greenhouse gases for smaller trips. Promotes my multimodal transit, so it'll look at the bicycle, um, pedestrians, buses, train. Also focus on how new development may influence the overall auto use. Um, it also promotes land diversity. And it, again, it moves, removes the focus on traffic at intersections and roadways. I should say um, for that, when we're looking at projects, there's still within our general plan um, guidance towards minimizing impact to intersections. So that, that could be looked at under any proposal that comes in because it is in our general plan. But in terms of CEQA review, that will no longer be um, an indicator that can be looked at. So how will Capital implement SB 743? Um, I've been working on a, a countrywide, uh, sorry, countywide vehicle mile tool with our uh, neighboring jurisdictions. It's been about a, a year of um, meetings, maybe every couple of months. Um, so we've put together some baseline vehicle mile travel modeling, and I, um, Kim Lee Horn has been the project contractor on this project, and uh, I also, Frederick Venter is on the call this evening. Um, so within there, we, we set up baseline vehicle mile travel modeling, set individual thresholds by city and county, um, and then the, Kim Lee Horn has also been putting together a BMT calculator, which you can see at the bottom of the slide. The developer will be able to come in in the future and put together exactly what their land use is and their square footage and um, the location. And this calculator will be able to quantify what the VMT is per the land use. So pretty um, exciting stuff in terms of being able to calculate our footprint for new projects in the future. Um, so the steps for implementation uh, under SD 743 is first to evaluate your land use. The second step is to screen for non-significant transportation impacts. So these are exceptions. If, if a project falls within, I think there's about six or seven uh, non-significant transportation impacts, then a project would not have to go through a v VMT uh, deep dive analysis. One of those projects is um, the future mall in terms of just the CEQA analysis for transportation because there's a metro station on site. Also, um, 
because of the, there's a, if there's a floor area ratio that's greater than 0.7, um, there, there are certain qualifiers in which you can make non-significant transportation impact findings um, that really are um, in support of mixed use, um, multimodal transportation, as well as um, exemptions for affordable housing development. So next, once you've screened, you determine the significance or threshold me methodology. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight is, or what will be in the resolution of adopting our thresholds. Um, and then the scope and analysis will be reviewed for the project. And if we find that the project is over the threshold that has been set, the applicant will have to provide mitigation. And one of the really cool things about the tool that Kim Lee Horn is putting together is they'll be, uh, the developer will be able to go in and see how much, um, what percentage they're off by in terms of meeting the threshold, and they can choose different mitigation um, mitigation strategies. And based on the effectiveness of that mitigation strategy, it will allow them to to see how their BMT is improved and know which one is best for them in order to meet the, meet the mitigated standard. And then there's always with CEQA ongoing mitigation monitoring. So from the OPR, uh, their recommendation to determine significant thresholds for new residential projects, they've set the standard at 15% below the existing countywide average of vehicle miles traveled per capita. Um, in your packet, there is a residential map and on that, you, the majority of the map is green and a little bit of it is yellow, but that's a really good sign because as projects come in, the areas in green would be um, found to have no impact and could be, uh, they wouldn't have to be reviewed for vehicle miles traveled. The yellow may have to uh, require a small bit of mitigation. The next is for office at 15%, the existing countywide BMT per employee. This um, in the maps that were provided in your packet also showed in our major um, commercial corridor areas, the majority of offices in yellow. And what that means is that um, the trend has been for, the, for those residents working in the offices in Capitola, they tend to um, commute a longer distance. So as new office um, land use came in, there would be mitigation tied to those. I think they're at about 10%, not quite the 15. So there would need to be a study done. And then for retail, you need to show no uh, net increase in total existing VMT. So what, what would happen there is um, the, we would look at the regional VMT. And so with the mall development, I'll give that as an example. Most likely because the, the mall is in the center of the, you know, well, actually the mall would I already told you it would um, qualify for the exemptions. But retail, the majority of the time when I've talked to uh, Kim Lee Horn, would be supported by our existing land use patterns and that by putting more retail in our commercial um, corridors, we're most likely just going to reduce trips because we're making more options in the center of our city. So rather than uh, sprawling outskirts, which we really lack within Capitola. So in this slide, I have the, the the overall thresholds of significance that were placed in the um, attachment, the document. And here's a list of common mitigation measures. And there were um, a full list of mitigation members with the mitigation measures within the document provided by Kim Lee Horn. But Typical mitigation includes parking mitigation, transit, education and encouragement, commute trip reduction, shared mobility, bike infrastructure, and neighborhood enhancements. Um, and that concludes my presentation this evening. My, the recommendation is to adopt a resolution establishing City of Capitola CEQA guidelines and transportation thresholds of significance of 15 as listed in the prior slide and the attachment uh, for purposes of complying with the Senate Bill 743.
with that, I'm here and Frederick Venter is here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. It looks like Councilmember Bertrand has a question. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So in doing this, um, I guess, software uh, tool, there must be weightings, um, you know, certain factors are weighted, uh, and that sort of gives you a sense of which things are being um, pushed rather than others. Is there anything of that sort? There is in terms of mitigation, the different mitigation strategies are weighted, and Frederick, would you like to chime in? I can't hear. I'm sorry, we can't hear, Frederick. Uh, I'm sorry, but Frederick? I'm just trying to get an idea of how the, the tool is constructed. Well, um, for any mitigation strategy, depending on the impact it would have on vehicle miles traveled, if it has a greater impact on vehicle miles traveled, it would be weighted more. So it would take down the percentage more. Um, so that's it. all factored in. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's all factored hey. into the tool. Yeah. Hey, so, Katie, Katie, can you hear me now? I can. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, this is some software you say. So uh, good evening, um, everyone. Um, so, so the tool um, reads back to model input and output. And what the travel demand model does, it um, estimates where people live and where they go do business, shop and work and go to school. Um, so, so those trips are being um, factored into what this tool does. So if you say I have a, a retail site and it's located in this area, the tool goes and geographically um, finds that location and then calculates the actual distance that it travels, um, you know, and then it takes um, ITE trip generation information. So if it is a house, it's going to say there's, um, you know, 10 trips per day for that house, and then um, it goes and calculates what the actual VMT is for that specific use. So it is very detailed and it's very closely linked to the Santa Cruz County Travel Demand Model. I have one other question. So um, right now, there's um, the recognition a lot of people like working at homes. Another way to do that is um, providing places, business places like Satellite that's in Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz, it provides an off-site place for people to go to instead of commuting to their place of work, they go to the Satellite office and work there. Um, would that be an acceptable way to uh, reduce VMT? Katie, okay, if you want me to go, so absolutely. It's, it's mm -hmm. one of the mitigation measures that we have is um, working from home, right? So we call it telecommuting, um, you know, and obviously COVID is a great, and also I'm not in the, in, the, in the bad sense or a good sense, but it's a great example of that it can be done. Um, you know, so we're gonna see that happen in the future. Yes, absolutely. So if a developer, made available part of the square footage to be such a location that would provide a benefit to their project or the approval of their project? Um, yes, so they would have to provide sufficient evidence that, that uh, you know, in, in their application that, um, you know, one can use that calculation to, to, to determine the VMT reduction. And then as the uh, mitigation monitoring happens year after year. Um, you know, obviously um, the city will then uh, make sure that the developer implements that measure, right? So if they say, hey, we're going to have people work here at a shorter distance or uh, this number of people will work from home, you know, you can you can do some trip counts at their driveways and make sure they actually do that. So there is a monitoring pro process also to make sure the mitigation um, is implemented. Okay, and I'm still trying to understand waiting so in a sense, I would expect you'd give more weight to a bus, which might transfer, transport you know, 50 people as opposed to a car. Is, is that a good way to understand waiting? So that's, uh, we call that mode split. Um, so it means that um, in, in the travel demand model, right, it will go and, um, and, and based on current uh, data and also future projections, 
it will give a, a so let's say there's 100 people that commute to an office and we say that uh, 5% of those are going to take the bus and another 6% is going to take the bike and there's maybe some people that will carpool. You know, some of those elements are in the model. It's not, this model is unfortunately not very detailed, but you can do off-model calculations, right? So one of the mitigation tools is to, if a developer comes back and say, hey, I would like to buy for the six people that would like to take the bus, I will pay partially for their transit tickets, right? Then, then that's the way you're going to mitigate and calculate that impact. So if the model says the VMT is 10 vehicle miles, um, you know, for, 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 the, for the staff and it's over, right, by, by two miles and you say, hey, you need to reduce it by 20% to get below, to get to eight miles, uh, vehicle miles traveled, he needs to show you that he's purchased that tickets for the bus, buses, and then you can say that's your mitigation for your VMP impact. Okay. And are you working with AMBAC on this? We um, so we've um, used the actual so, so the AMBAG model uh, sort of gave some input, but we've uh, used the most recent Santa Cruz County travel demand model. Um, but of course, the AMBAG model um, is, is sort of uh, the basis of that because it helps to determine the external trips outside of Santa Cruz County. Um, we've also used some big data for trips that specifically leave the county and actually goes over the hill to the Bay Area too. So pretty pretty extensive exercise. So is the Santa Cruz model with Metro or Caltrans Metro? How, where's that come from? This will be a actual, uh, so it's a, it's a county model right now, the, the Santa Cruz County, and between the county and RTC, they sort of maintain, RTC, I, I, okay. yeah, they maintain the county model. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It looks like Council Member Story has his hand up now. Um, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, it seems like a very significant uh, change uh, in our SQL analysis and, um, you know, and it's kind of complicated to get your head around it, but I guess the question I wanted to ask and trying to apply it to our real life situation coming up with the mall um, and the Malangari development of the mall, since the mall is a bus stop, uh, which has some um, incentives uh, included with it. There will be affordable housing, which also has some incentives included with it. It is going to be significant amount of retail, which is, I guess, is soon to be neutral. Um, so I guess my question is, is this new standard going to tie our hands or our ability to require Mullen Geyer to make infrastructure um, uh, mitigations uh, to 41st Avenue and Capitola Road to uh, address some of the significant uh, vehicle miles that are going to occur there, in my view, in spite of the, these particular incentives. Um, so I guess I wanted to pose that question and maybe hear the staff response. Um, and then I also wanted to, what is the extent of our discretion um, on this item? It sounds like it's already been approached, approved by the state. Um, so I wonder, too, how much discretion we actually have um, with, um, you know, abiding by uh, SB 753. Um. So first, uh, I'll start with the discretion. Under SB 743, we are required to have standards in place and any new applications that come in after July 1 must be reviewed under the VMT. Um, but we do have discretion in what our percentages are for if we didn't want to accept the 15% um, regional standards, which is what OPR suggests, and it actually, I think, is a good standard for Capitola where we're primarily, uh, we've got some healthy land use going on. We don't have much sprawl development. It is all infill development, so I do think vehicle miles travel is a, is a good standard in which to help with our, um, you know, carbon reduction and it's for, for CEQA purposes. In terms of the, you know, future development, 
So your discretion is, is in the percentages, and if we wanted to modify those at all, um, and Frederick can talk a little bit about what the other neighboring jurisdictions are doing, but I think we've all decided to take the OPR standards, just whether or not we're looking at a regional methodology or just within our individual cities. Um, and then in terms of impacts associated with development, within CEQA there's, um, I want to say 14 standards of review that will be looked at. So it's not only your LOS when you're looking at traffic, you're going to be looking at safety and noise. Um, we'll be looking at, under our general plan also, we'll be looking at the project and we've got standards uh, tied to LOS within our general plan and circulation, but it just, um, in terms of CEQA, that analysis will not be available to tie back to the LOS, but there are all the other elements that have to be looked at for environmental review within CEQA that tie back to each project. And Frederick, do you want to add to that? Um, Katie, let me, sure. So, so let, me, let me jump in here. Sorry, Katie. I just, yeah, yeah. I think I wanted to directly answer the question that Sam asked, which was with the mall project, does this limit our discretion or our ability to offset some of the impacts? And because the mall project is going to be is such a discretionary permit, they're looking for a development agreement and a rezone as part of their project. The city does have the same level of discretion. In other words, we're not relying on CEQA to mitigate the project. We're going to determine what the appropriate mitigations are, and we're going to negotiate that as part of an overall development agreement. So in the case of the mall project, which is the large, that's the elephant in the room in terms of the projects coming down the horizon, we still have the same level of, of uh, analysis and mitigations that we can negotiate. In terms of smaller projects where there isn't that level of discretionary control, that's where the state switch from the LOS standard to the VMT standard will change the kinds of mitigations we can get off smaller projects. It, it, Jamie is correct. So, so, so the, the discretion that you have is within your general plan, right? So CEQA is going to address the VMP impacts. Any other discretion, so let's say you have a level, so the mall adds traffic and the level of service fails and you, you need to fix up that intersection, that level of service deficiency that you want to fix is going to be within your general plan. That, that's where you have the discretion. The, 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 you, you can actually go and, and apply that to, uh, to, to, to the, the, the to the conditions of approval for the, for the project. That answers your question, Council Member Story. Um, yes, it did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks has her hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, this is specifically about the resolution on page 171. At the very end of page 171, it says that the city authorizes the community development director to update the VMT thresholds of significance. And um, I guess my question is, how often do you anticipate these changes occurring? Um, and is this something that other cities, you know, is this common that if there were any changes to the threshold that it just is to the discretion of the community development director? So I would anticipate as new technology comes out, like the autonomous vehicles and as new, you know, new transportation um, mitigations come out is when we would come in and update um, and also, um, because this is the first time around on this, and I think we we are we've got a whole new tool um, as we're working through projects, and as we realize that if there's uh, uh, portions of this that need to be updated, I would be um, bringing it forth uh, to council for updates on the threshold. So I don't I would. Um, we could likely reword this to make it clear that it would be the um, community.
community development director, but I think in all of these circumstances, I don't think it would be me and my office updating thresholds, but reporting back to city council if any thresholds of significance were changed. Yep. Katie, it, it usually also happens when there's a model update, right? So when the next regional transportation plan is compiled by RTC, right, there will be a new model. So by then, uh, trip characteristics would have changed and there will be most likely the new VMT. So that's a very logical point, or well, there's a general plan update. Uh, those, those are usually the points at which you will see VMT changes. That threshold may change. Thank you. I, I would like to see some clarification just included in the language on the resolution. This all fascinates me, and I would just hope that it continues to come back to council for for discussion and updates. That, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Story, do you have your hand up again or was that from your previous question? Okay. Uh, Council Member, okay. Council Member Bertrand, do you have a brief question before we move on to public comment? Yeah, um, there was just a mention of the general plan. Um, I need to be reminded, is VNT addressed in the general plan? LOS I think is, but is VNT addressed? Uh, I, I'm almost 100% certain that it is addressed in the general plan because that, that's really um, the uh, the way in which all transportation is going. Is you know we're, we're talking about building in and infill development and not um, supporting sprawl. So I can I'd be happy to follow up with you on that question, um, but I, I don't have the general plan in front of me at this moment, but we could discuss that. I could follow up at a later date. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll do that. Katie, greenhouse, greenhouse, all greenhouse gas emissions and air quality calculations happen through VMT. Oh, yes, that, that is addressed. That's true. Okay, thanks very much. All right, seeing no additional questions from the comments, uh, we will now open this item for public comment. If there are any members of the public that would like to address the council. Turn it over to you, Larry. Mayor Peterson, I do not see anyone in with their hand raised, and I do not see any emails on this item. All right, thank you. We'll bring it back to council for discussion and a vote. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks has her hand up. Yeah, I so move staff's recommendation with the edit to page 171. Uh, section that we just specify that it comes back to council. Thanks. I'll second. I'm, I'm sorry, could I, Council, or Vice Mayor Brooks, could you say again what section of the resolution you're proposing to edit? Yeah, so packet page 171 at the very bottom, be it further resolved that the City of Capitola authorizes the Community Development Director to update the DMP. I just wanted to make sure that it was clear it goes to council first and that the community development just doesn't do it without bringing it to, to council. Okay. And, and Sam, under, we had an updated packet, so on the other right. it's, it's page 174 at the bottom. Right, okay, thank you. I, 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 have, a, I have that version. Okay, so it would, how would that, that verbiage change? You would just, you're just proposing to insert um, authorizes is necessary and appropriate. Um, it seems like you, Vice Mayor Brooks, are you proposing to simply strike that provision? Well, you know what? I'm so sorry. I'm re now that I'm reading it out loud. I fully apologize to waste your time. It does say that the city of Capicola authorizes the community development director, which in other words means it does come back to city council. So I apologize. So I'll rescind my original motion and just make a motion to adopt the staff recommendation. I second again. Okay. All right. Uh, we have a motion by Vice Mayor Brooks and a second by uh, Council Member Bertrand. Any additional comments? Seeing none, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Botorf. Aye. Councilmember Story. Aye. 
Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. And Mayor Peterson? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. We'll move on to the final item tonight. Uh, 8G, consider approval of memoranda of understanding with labor groups and adopt salary schedule for June 28, 2020 through December 26, 2020. Uh, before the City Council this evening, as part of this agenda item 8G, is a recommendation to approve salary and benefit reductions for the following employee groups. Capitola Police Officers Association, Confidential, Mid-Management, Police Captain, and At-Will Management Employees. The At-Will Management Employees consist of Department Heads and the City Manager. The employee agreements before the City Council include a 6% salary reduction effective June 28, 2020 through December 26, 2020 for the listed groups, including at-will management and the city manager. All listed groups, including at-will management and the city manager, will receive 40 hours of leave to be used before 1-1-2021. With that, I will turn it over to see if there's any additional information in the form of a staff report. There is, Mayor. Thank you for that presentation as required by state law. I'm going to go through very quickly uh, several slides. Um, this was a concession bargaining effort that we went into with our employee groups due to the fiscal crisis associated with the economic downturn from the pandemic. Council and the community will remember that we had a $4.5 million budget deficit that we were trying to resolve this year in the budget. The adopted budget closed that gap through $2.8 million in reductions to non-personnel spending and a $1.5 million in reductions to personnel costs, and then $140,000 out of fund balance. And recall that comes on top of about $1.5 million in fund balance that we've needed to use in the fiscal year we're still in today. So the city and employee groups began good faith concession bargaining in April. And then all, um, all agreements other than the POA, the Police Officers Association agreements, will expire at the end of this month. We were able to reach six-month agreements with all of the employee groups, with the exception of the Association of Capitola, excuse me, Association of Capitola employees. Originally, the city sought an 8% furlough from all the groups, which would have closed city hall facilities, city facilities for one day per pay period. However, ultimately a closure plan was not gonna work if we couldn't have agreement from all the groups. It was impossible to uh, have, for example, your management staff um, not working every Friday and having the rest of your staff working. So as a result of failing to get the 8% closure, uh, we ended up, furlough, excuse me, we ended up with a 6% uh, reduction that was agreed to by mid-management, confidential, the police captains, and executive management. Um, so that, the 6% is made up of a 2% straight reduction in pay, and then 4% reduction associated with 40 hours of additional leave that has to be used before the end of the year. Uh, the POA has also come to an agreement on an on a agreement with the city a 2% reduction in pay, and then deferring their contracted 2.25% COLA, which was planned for um, the 1st of July to moving it out to January 1st. The employee concessions that are included in the agreement will result in approximately $175,000 in savings over the first six months of the fiscal year. And as a result of failing to reach agreement with ACE, the city issued layoff notices for three positions within the ACE group. The recommended action for this evening is to authorize the city manager to execute side letter agreements with the, from the existing MOUs with the changes that would be in effect from June 26th through December 28th with the following groups, the Capitola Police Officers Association, the Mid-Management Employee Bargaining Unit, the confidential employee bargaining unit, and the police captains. In addition, recommending changes to the management compensation plan that covers department heads and approve a fifth amendment to the city manager's contract that makes the same changes as other employees. Lastly, I'm recommending adoption of a resolution that approves the new salary schedule. And then as a final step, 
I would recommend individually attesting that council members would receive the same percent salary redu reduction as other employees. And with that, I'm available for questions. All right, uh, any members of the council have questions? Seeing none, I uh, will bring this item to public comment. So public comment for this item is now open. I will turn it over to Larry to determine if there's anyone uh, speaking to speak or if there are any emails that have come in. Uh, I do not see any hands raised to speak. Um, I do know there's a couple emails that we will read. Um, okay. Excuse me, click the wrong button. Good evening, Mayor Peterson, Vice Mayor Brooks, and members of the City of Capitola Council. My name is Maura Hurley. I am City of Capitola Account I, an ACUPEC Local 792 member. My layoff is tomorrow. I have decided to comment here as I had not planned to comment at the end of the meeting. ACE Union members held three votes in regards to negotiations. On our first vote, our members reached consensus to forfeit vacation payouts and negotiate further with hope of an offer that would enable our members to work full time. We opposed the furlough of ACE employees and agreed to the suspension of vacation cash outs. We ask that the city look to other parts of the budget for the remaining $58,000 in savings. We wanted to ensure our members can afford to live in Santa Cruz County. We honestly thought that the city would give thorough thought and consideration to the fact that the damage to the economic stability of 24 employee households during a global health and economic crisis far outweighs $58,000 in value. The city's first response was layoff notices. ACE members were given two days to change our decision or three positions will be laid off. The total compensation for these three positions is far greater than the savings first proposed by the city. The next day there was a tied vote in the union and a third vote was taken in person by secret ballot. The vote was tied again resulting in the status quo, no furlough. I received my official layoff notice Monday in the mail and my layoff is tomorrow. Not one member of my management team has contacted me. I don't know if it is the finance director that dictates this behavior or if it is misguidance from the personnel department. When I asked why, the personnel officer told me once they gave the letter to the union they could not discuss it with me. This simply is not true. From the National Labor Review Board, quote, you cannot bypass the union and deal directly with employees. However, you may communicate to your employees accurate information about your bargaining proposals. Website info, nlrb.gov. Bargaining in good faith with employees union representative. I have two other personnel experiences where the personnel officer has not followed through on his word with actions. Important personnel documents and administrative rules have not been brought before you as promised. My good faith effort with personnel has spanned 2.5 years and ends tonight with my layoff. Please listen to the Association of Capitola Employees' concerns with compassion. Thank you. I have another email. This is Ryan Heron, ACE Labor Representative. The city manager approached ACE in recent weeks and asked us to take an 8.1% reduction in work hours and pay, as well as the elimination of vacation cash outs for a period of one year. It was explained to us that these two items together would save the city an estimated $68,000 for the fiscal year 2020-21. ACE membership voted to approve the freezing of the vacation cash out for one year, but rejected the work hour reduction and associated pay reduction. ACE does not dispute that there is a real crisis facing the city budget as a result of COVID-19. We just believe there are other ways to balance the budget besides on the back of ACE employees. ACE employees are the lowest paid full-time employees in the city. 
An 8.1% reduction in pay for some ACE employees could be the difference between being able to pay their bills and monthly rent slash mortgages. For many ACE members, this was untenable and would require them to seek other employment outside the city. Other city employees such as mid-management, police, and confidential slash executive management employees are higher paid in relation to ACE employees, and we believe it is not unreasonable for the city to expect those higher paid employees to take larger concessions than ACE employees. I am of the understanding that the previously agreed to furloughs for mid-management and some other employees will not go forward as planned since ACE rejected the furlough. I do not believe there is any reason why the city cannot do higher furloughs on some units than on ACE. Any refusal to do so would simply be a policy choice in my view. In addition to ACE employees being paid less than these other bargaining units, ACE employees are also already paid significantly less than their counterparts in neighboring public agencies. As part of our current MAL, the city performed a compensation study using selected comparator agencies in the area. This study definitively showed that Capitola is paying its employees less than the fair market rate for most positions. For example, accountant is compensated at 7.5% below market median for total compensation, administrative assistant is 6.2% below, assistant planner is 5.8% below, building inspector 2 is 17.24% below, maintenance worker 2 is 11.67% below, Mechanic is 8.5% below, parking enforcement officer is 17.2% below, receptionist is 13.5% below, and recreation coordinator is 14.6% below the market median for total compensation. ACE was approaching MAU negotiations in 2020 with high hopes that we would bring these positions up to the market median rate. However, once COVID-19 hit, that all changed. As a result of ACE rejecting the furloughs, the city manager has issued three layoff notices to ACE employees as of last week. I estimate the salary savings associated with these layoffs to be well in excess of $200,000 for the upcoming fiscal year. I am struggling to understand why our rejection of a proposal to save the city $68,000 would necessitate layoffs that would save this much money. One layoff of a full-time employee should give the city the necessary savings to cover ACE's rejection of the furlough. Additionally, in recent weeks a full-time receptionist at City Hall unexpectedly quit her position. This represents a large savings that is more than the total savings that was being asked of ACE in the city's furlough proposal. Thank you. Ryan Heron, Labor Relations Representative. United Public Employees of California Local 792. I do not see any additional emails. All right. With that, we will bring it back to council for deliberation and a vote. Um, hmm. Are there any additional council comments or? Councilmember Bosmer? Oh, I'm sorry. There you are. Councilmember Bosmer, yes, please. Thank you, Mayor. You know, this was a difficult decision for everybody on the council and the city manager. I think the message that was sent here was this was a time for the city to all dig deep and to try to get us through this. Uh, as was mentioned in the letter, you know, when COVID-19 came, everything changed. I think that hit the nail on the head. None of this is an easy decision for any of us, and I know that it impacts others more than, than some others just because of the pay rate. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. I, I'm trying to be optimistic by everything we're doing to try to help the merchants open up, help the city open up. If this solution turns around in six months, and at that time, I look forward to sitting down and renegotiating with these uh, groups and trying to get back to normal. But based on the information that I have available to me and the city manager presented to the council, I'm going to make a motion to approve staff recommendations. 
We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. For further discussion? No additional discussion from the council. I want to um, I want to acknowledge that we do see that there are two attendees with their hands up right now, but because we did close public comment already, the time for uh, public comment would have been uh, before the emails and also after the, the emails were read when we gave a moment for additional comments. So I do want to acknowledge that you're, you're not being ignored, but the time for uh, the public comment period has been, has been closed. So we do have a, a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, if there's no additional comment, uh, we will, uh, oh, sorry, back to panelists. Council, <laughs> Council Member Bosworth, my apologies. Uh, Mayor, I, I just raised my hand after acknowledging that there were people that raised their hand. And due to the fact that this format for running a meeting might be difficult, uh, I, I think that if two members want to weigh in, I, I would make, I would feel comfortable allowing them to speak if it's at the mayor's will, though. Okay, is that, um, I'll turn to our city manager and city attorney, is that uh, quite literally at the mayor's will? It is. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, in that case, I'm not reopening public comment for all. I'm reopening public comment for Barbara and Allie, who appear to have put their hands up right as we were closing public comment. So we will allow them uh, the, the normal three minutes each to speak. Okay, um, Barbara, you can go ahead. Hi, thank you for allowing us to speak. I appreciate that. I've been an employee, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I've been an employee for Capitola City for over eight years. And I just wanna to convey to the city council, we are more than just members. We are families that are trying to make ends meet. The layoffs, and furloughs will cause employees and families to lose their health care during COVID. And the council needs to be held accountable for their choice to allow those layoffs. The city's greatest assets is their employees, not the tourists. The council must be considerate in this time of great challenge and suffering. We are in such a time right now. I feel that um, something that we should consider that we are a very small city and we work within and around the city manager and the assistant manager very closely and say it's a bit intimidating to voice our concerns when we work so closely to the manager is an understatement. It's quite intimidating. That being said, I have worked here for nearly eight years and I have been a resident of Capitola for 35 years. And I don't recall one time that the city employees have not agreed to, off, to the offer made by the city when it comes to negotiations. This is really a challenging time. And I just feel that especially our group is such a low paying group. And to ask for an 8% cut in pay on the backs of these employees when management and the POA negotiated a far less. And when we have so many employees that have recently left, I just don't see the numbers of $68,000. And I just feel that as a council, you should look at the entire picture of what the cost savings of these recent vacancies and consider that for these employees because so many of these employees that um, they're just barely making it. And I just feel greatly that we should consider that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Barbara. We appreciate your comments. I believe Allie is the next person with her hand up. Hi, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, I had actually emailed twice, but I don't know how that never made it um, to Larry. Anyways, um, so my name is Allie Clifford. I'm a recreation coordinator with the city of Capitola and my last day of work is tomorrow. Um, I have one of the three positions being laid off. I have been with the city for just shy of nine years. Excuse 
me. I'm a recreation coordinator for almost two. I'm a three-quarter time employee. I was responsible for all of our recreation classes, independent contractor instructors, our recreation brochure, building rentals, events, marketing, and social media. I voted no on the furlough, knowing my job was at stake because myself, as well as my fellow ACE Union employees, are already so overworked and underpaid, I just couldn't in good faith ask my fellow coworkers to take a pay cut to save my job. The salary study done last year was proof of how underpaid many of us from within the city are. My position in particular is already 14.6% below, 14 below the market median. If you were to take a look at a paycheck from myself or any other of our union members, you would see that the take-home pay is barely, if even at all, enough to be able to afford to live in Santa Cruz County. I will soon be on unemployment and with a temporary extra $600 a week of federal stimulus. I'll actually make more on unemployment than I do now. The proposed 8.1% furlough would have been too much, too huge of a financial hit for many of my fellow coworkers. We already struggle enough as it is. We shouldn't have to struggle more than we already do. I personally don't feel the city has been diligent enough or transparent enough in finding other alternatives besides these layoffs. Thank you. Thank you, Allie. All right, we're going to bring it back to council. Uh, council member Story has his hand. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, after uh, hearing Barbara and Allie speak, um, you know, I couldn't hold back and not acknowledge their pain and how difficult of a situation it is. this is um, for everyone concerned. Um, and we certainly hate to see that it came to layoffs um, and to Allie in particular and uh, any of the staff. Uh, but you know, everyone's in a dire strait, um, and all the other staff have agreed to reductions. Um, and, um, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, we couldn't get um, other reductions from uh, uh, the ACE staff. Um, I understand their viewpoint, um, but, you know, I think it's important that everyone um, kind of move together uh, in this. Um, and um, I'm hoping, um, you know, maybe it didn't need to be 8%, but I didn't, under, I didn't hear or understand that there was any um, counter offer made. Um, but, uh, and so this is where we've ended up. Um, if there's some way, ability to salvage um, these layoffs, I would certainly be open to it, um, but I'm really, um, you know, I'm sorry that we have to lay out uh, positions at this time. Um, but um, I think that we felt that we were kind of pushed into that position. So um, I just want to acknowledge and thank uh, Barbara and Allie uh, for speaking up. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Story. Uh, are there any other comments from members of the council? Okay. Um, I echo what Council Member Story said in acknowledging the pain and the hurt that is clearly heard here tonight. It's understandable and it's justifiable that, that there is that you are experiencing this pain and this frustration. And I hesitate to say what I want to say next because I feel like it it um, minimizes the the hurt that we just heard, and that's not my intention in any way at all. What I want to share is that we are also hearing from community grant recipients that we are causing pain 
We are also hearing from business owners that we have caused them pain. We're hearing from residents that we have caused them pain. And it's not anything that any one of us wanted to cause to any of those people. And we are in such challenging times that I know that we are all feeling that challenge. And these are, are very difficult decisions that we didn't come to lightly. And I want to share that, that we all, well, I don't speak for the, for the whole council, but I speak for myself and I speak for what I perceived in the discussions that were had, that we were all feeling the weight of these choices. Councilmember Bertrand has his hand up too, and I believe he has comments. Councilmember Bertrand, you're still muted. Sorry. Um, I just want to recognize that it is particularly hard for the people that are being laid off. I've been in that position multiple times in 30 to 40 years of my work experience, and in many cases under very dire circumstances where I didn't know we we're going to be able to pay for things for our family. So I totally understand what you're going through. I'd also like to recognize that there's been a lot of sacrifices by the people who work for Capitola, part of the general employees for the city. And so I want to also recognize their sacrifice too. And um, even though some may be paying more of a sacrifice. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't see any additional hands up uh, from council members. I believe, uh, and perhaps our city clerk can confirm for me that I believe we had a motion and a second already. That is correct. Uh, council member Batorf was the mover and council member Bertrand seconded. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there's no further comment from council, uh, to, uh, can we get a roll call vote, please? Yes. Council member Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Batorf. Aye. Councilmember Story. Um, aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion uh, carries unanimously. That brings us to the end of our meeting tonight. Um, please take care of yourselves physically and mentally and emotionally and take care of each other and we will see you again soon.